name is Jerry Anderson. I'm a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management, and I will have the, the pleasure of moderating this session today. The session is part of a, a year-long centennial celebration of uh, the School of Public Health. As many of you know, we've been having a whole series of seminars on this. Uh, this is the month for the Department of Health Policy and Management, so we have five seminars going on this month on a whole variety of topics. Bob Brook is at the, uh, over at the other part of the school right now, one of our alumni, talking about quality of care. Um, pharmaceuticals are a, clearly a very important part of the healthcare system. I mean, many of us wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for drugs like penicillin because they, they, are, they keep us alive. And we essentially need those. We need the innovation from the pharmaceutical industry to, to get the next generations of drugs. You know, in the past it was penicillin. Now it could be the Zika virus. We need the research that essentially is ongoing on those things. At the same time, we're very concerned about health care prices. We're very concerned about specifically about drug prices. Um, what we did this year was we spent a lot of time worrying about the issues of generic drugs. Um, we had a poster child that made it very easy for us to talk about generic drugs. Martin Screlly, we all remember him very well uh, with his 5,000% price increases. And we essentially um, had the opportunity uh, with Melissa Lindemood leading us on a whole set of activities to talk to Congress. So Jerry McGreen and I talked to Congress. Um, we then, uh, along with uh, Josh Arstein, wrote a paper in JAMA talking about it and have been working with the members of Congress on the whole issue of generic pricing specifically on these drugs that um, have very high price increases and those sets of activities. So that's essentially uh, what we've been doing on the generic space, but what we want to talk about today is the brand name drug space, um, and that's where I, I'm, I'm particularly concerned in a number of particular areas. Um, I'm definitely concerned about high drug prices. I'm definitely concerned of, about how much programs like Medicare and Medicaid are spending. But what I'm really concerned about is access to care. Um, the prices that are set in many of the pharmaceutical uh, industry are just not sustainable to allow all of us to have access to the pharmaceuticals uh, that we need. One of my assistants uh, who worked with me for many years, Karen Diener, um, had hepatitis C. And she went through a whole series of clinical trials uh, when the hepatitis C drugs really didn't work very well and had really bad side effects. Uh, but she wanted to deal with her hepatitis C. Uh, unfortunately, she's died recently, but essentially, um, you know, the, the legacy of these new drugs that deal with hepatitis C that are actual cures for the thing with very few side effects are just miraculous. They are a true blessing for us. At the same time, only about one in, uh, in less than one in 10 people who have hepatitis C are getting the drug, and in programs like Medicaid, it's only 2.7% of the people who have hepatitis C are actually getting the drug. So I essentially want to make sure that people who have drugs like hepatitis C get them. What keeps me awake at night, Sean, and is, is really the issues for you, um, and that is an Alzheimer's drug. That's what really concerns me, not because I don't want an Alzheimer's drug. I definitely want an Alzheimer's drug. It's something that we all really care about. But the concern that I have is the price for an Alzheimer's drug will be approximately $100,000, and it won't be a cure. And if we have a $100,000 price tag for an Alzheimer's drug that's not a cure, and Medicare, Medicare pays 80% of the cost of that drug, that means that Medicare is effectively paying $80,000 a year for an Alzheimer's drug. And there are 5 million people with dementia. If you do the math, 
$80,000 times 5 million people is $400 billion a year. That's how much we currently spend on pharmaceuticals right now. So clearly that's not going to happen. But what is the policy option that we have that CMS can do, that Congress can do, that somebody can do so that the price tag becomes something that's possible uh, for CMS to afford in, 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 in our lifetime? I mean, there are just so many things that, like that that we essentially want to do. So what essentially is is the challenge of how do we afford these things uh, for things like the Alzheimer's drug? So with that is sort of, for me, a very scary story. Um, essentially what we need to have is a dialogue that will essentially try to figure out how do we come up with policy options, how do we come up with solutions to these emerging problems. And that's what we want to try to do today, is take a look at a number of these options that are out there to try to figure it out. So how are we going to proceed on this? Well, today what we're going to start with is a conversation between Jeremy Green and Henry Waxman about the past. What have been the policy issues in the past? How have we tackled them? What has been the history of drug pricing? Then we will turn to Caleb Alexander. And what Caleb's going to talk about are what are the policy options that are on the agenda for today that are in the literature? What, what, what do we think of as the good solutions? Then what we're going to move on is not that these are not good solutions, because they are, but what can Hopkins do to think of new ways to deal with this particular issue? And so four of us are going to be presenting uh, for what we think are relatively new policy options to try to deal with the, the particular issue. Then what we have is a very esteemed panel of people who are from the, uh, from the, from the government, from private foundations, from industry, talking about how they see the, the issues of today, how they see the uh, recommendations that we are making and the other recommendations on the table, what, are, what, what, what should we be thinking about as we deal with these issues uh, of today? Um, and then we return uh, to Henry Waxman, who's been listening very closely to this conversation, and essentially say, you know, looking forward to the policy agenda for the next years, the next five years, what essentially are we doing? So that's essentially what the agenda is. Um, I can tell you that we did not put any breaks in for you. Um, it's just, it's going to be a jam-packed conversation. Um, and so what we will try to do is give you a minute or two in between these things to stand up. I'm not going to lead you in a yoga or any other type of activity, um, but essentially, you know, we know that you will need to take stretches and, and do things, but we haven't set up any breaks in that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and to Henry. Um, and let me just introduce um, both of them, although both of them don't need that much of an introduction. Essentially what we have, Henry Waxman is our centennial scholar. He's been with us since July. Um, he's had an opportunity to teach in a lot of courses. He gives a seminar every month about a different policy issue. Um, Henry has worked on so many different policy issues in public health that essentially we need to um, have him stay another six months. So it's a centennial year with, that goes for 18 months on those sets of activities. So that's essentially what we have. Um, he has worked on every single policy issue that we deal with in, in, in public health. With that, um, He's going to be interviewed by Jeremy Green, who is a historian at, the, at, at Johns Hopkins. He's a, a, physi a practicing physician. Um, he's written a number of books on the pharmaceutical industry. His most recent one is, is entitled Generic. And with that, I will ask both of you to come up and have a conversation.
introduction. And uh, Congressman Waxman, thank you again for joining us. It's really a pleasure for me as a physician and a historian concerned about questions of pharmaceutical access to be able to begin this conference with a conversation about the relevance of history to the present and the future. And I, I'd like to begin with a question about um, an act that bears your name. You were a key architect of one of the most durable solutions to improving the affordability of prescription drug pricing for, for Americans, really, in this country's history. But the problems that were faced that led to the passage of that of, of the Hatch-Waxman or Waxman-Hatch Act in this, on this audience in 1984, <laughs> um, they bear echoes of similarity with the problems we face today, and yet they reflect a much different time. Could I ask you to begin by reflecting on the problems of brand name pricing and generic drug availability in the 1970s and 80s leading up to this legislation? That, that, what, that what was the problem that the Hatch-Waxman Act solved? Uh, prior to that law, for a generic to be approved, a generic had to go into the FDA, and even though it was the exact same drug as the pioneer drug, they had to go through and all the tests on safety and efficacy as if it were a brand new drug. Uh, that involved a lot of expense and probably uh, unethical to do some of those trials again. So uh, we did not have a, a way for generics to get approved quickly. At the same time, the brand name drugs were looking at the fact that when uh, efficacy was attached to the requirement for pre-approval of drugs, the companies had to spend a lot more money on trials while they were awaiting FDA approval. They were complaining that they were not able to get the full benefit of their patent because so much time was being spent at the FDA. Now, that first argument was the one that was carrying the day in the Congress because the pharmaceutical industry asked for a restoration of some of the time they spent at the FDA. That bill passed the Senate by a huge margin. It came to the House and uh, it got out of the committee. Nobody seemed to have any problems with these bills and it went to the House floor late in the session. And it was so late in the session that the only way it could be brought up was under a suspension calendar. Suspension calendar, in effect, meant that the bill was so popular that no amendment could be offered to it, but it required two-thirds vote to pass. There was a young congressman named Al Gore who was on the Commerce Committee and a good friend of mine, and he and I talked about it. We said, this is really going to be unfair to consumers because the longer the brand name company can hold on to their monopoly, the more the consumer was going to have to pay for the costs of the drug. And when uh, some of the companies had monopoly, they charged monopoly prices. So we didn't want that to pass. And we started working hard to line up the votes for that, uh, that suspension calendar bill consideration. All we needed was a third plus one. We worked hard, and we got the, the enough votes to stop the two-thirds from passing it. Then uh, companies started going to, the industry started going to the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee would pass a rule to allow the bill to be brought up, but Al Gore had a, a special friendship with the chairman of the Rules Committee at the time, and we only had a short period of time. Congress went out, and the bill never was considered. In the next Congress, uh, when I was chairman of the Health and Environment Subcommittee, we said, why don't, we didn't have any jurisdiction over the patent part, we did over exclusivity, but not the patent part. And we came up with the idea of a balance. We'll give the manufacturers, the innovators, a little bit more time to get the full benefit of their uh, return on investment uh, as, as, as a patent would uh, get, give them. But we would give them, a, in addition to that, something that's even better than a patent, an exclusivity which meant that the FDA could not approve a competitor. And we would give uh, an exclusivity for a, l a longer time to restore some of the time lost at the FDA. But in exchange, we wanted an abbreviated new drug application process for generics 
so that they could be approved immediately. There had been a case uh, sometime earlier called the Bolar case, and the Bolar case said that the generic manufacturers could get all the information they needed to prepare the generic, but they couldn't get it approved, but they could be ready to get it approved as soon as the uh, patent expired, and we provided for the patent and the exclusivity uh, to expire, and then we'd get a, a new a generic approved right away. That was the balance. That was the basis of the legislation, as it, uh, particularly as it left the House. And then when it went to the Senate, there were a lot more refinements. Many companies said they had drugs in the pipeline. They talked about other circumstances where they wanted to be sure that um, we, uh, we, we took care of those concerns. And thus, uh, the law was passed in the, in the mid-'80s. Uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's popularly known as the Hatch-Waxman Act, so I don't need anybody to uh, bestow extra uh, praise upon me as, as the co-author. But uh, it was called the Waxman Hatch Act for a short period of time. <laughs> but I even call it the Hatch Waxman Act for fear that somebody will rename the bill the, the Haxman Watch Act or something <laughs> like that. So that, uh, that's the law, and that was the balance that we tried to achieve in the mid 80s that would give incentive for development of new breakthroughs, at the same time, give the consumer the break that uh, competition would provide in lowering the price. So balancing innovation and access, and when President Ronald Reagan signed the bill, he, he said very clearly, everyone wins with this piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what were the immediate consequences of the bill after it passed, and what were the longer-term consequences, the, looking now several decades later, that might not have been anticipated at, the, at, the, at that time? And are there any ways in which you, you might think the bill would merit revisiting or revision at this point? Well, there are times when we did revisit the bill over the years. We had um, uh, different periods of time when the, a competitor would be stopped, and, uh, and, the, and the brand companies look for ways to keep on extending that monopoly longer and longer and longer, and we did correct some of those, uh, some of those provisions. The first result was a, a, a breakthrough for a lot of generic drugs. They got on the market. It was interesting how the two companies, the two sides of the, of the pharmaceutical industry uh, looked at each other. The brand name companies looked at the generic manufacturers at parasites. They're taking the benefit of the work that we've done. They don't deserve to do that. They don't know what they're doing. At the same time, the generic manufacturers were producing some of the same drugs that were being sold as brand name drugs. They were, they were manufacturing. They had the cap capability of manufacturing the drugs. So they're doing the manufacturing for the brand name drugs, but then the brand name drugs were calling them uh, incompetent <laughs> to be on their own. Uh, but we saw a, a dramatic increase in uh, generics being approved, especially as the, uh, the patent life of many drugs expired and the exclusivity period expired as well. And it saved an enormous amount of money for the, uh, for the payers for these drugs, which are sometimes taxpayers through the Medicare and Medicaid programs, sometimes through the uh, private pharmaceutical system, and often individuals who would buy the drugs uh, for themselves. But uh, it, this is a business, and therefore people were looking at how to take the law and interpret it in ways that would benefit them economically. Uh, and we had to try to stop evergreening, which was a term used to continue to develop a little variation of a drug so they can get another patent, and keep going and trying to get another patent after that to maintain the monopoly. We tried to chase after those, those uh, areas and uh, plug them up. And I think there are a lot of things we might want to do in the future, which is why I'm so pleased that, uh, that Johns Hopkins is working on this very issue of high drug prices and what we can do about it, because we, we really need to think through uh, how to change things for the future. We never anticipated, we might, should have perhaps, that uh, those who had the monopoly were going to push it to the extreme and charge the, the highest possible prices for the longest period of time. Uh, and we never anticipated the generic drugs would make, make deals with the brand name drugs to sell off the market, what was called a pay for play which is an issue that has, uh, has advanced uh, all the way to the Supreme Court and, uh, 
And while there's no clear-cut answer to it, it seems like the, the, the pay-for-play just for a win-win of the two companies, but the lo a loss for the consumers is, is, seems to be on its way out. Well, uh, another major piece of legislation affecting drug access that you were involved in was the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which uh, many in this audience will know provided drug benefits to the Medicare population. And this allowed for private insurers to provide benefits to Medicare beneficiaries, but it also precluded the Medicare program from negotiating prices with mm -hmm. drug companies, a very important topic uh, at the present time. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, can you describe some of the negotiations that led to this law in its current form being passed? And how would you evaluate the impact of that legislation and its program today? Well, right now we're seeing a lot of public concern about the high cost of drugs. Back then, when Part D was adopted for Medicare, we saw a lot of uh, enormous concern. Some of it generated by studies that were done for individual members of Congress to announce in their districts about the fact that most people who bought drugs, people, not, not their payers, but individuals, had to pay twice as much for their drug as those who had insurance coverage or those who were in Europe or Canada, and that um, we, even, we did a series of reports and people talked about it at, at the community level. Oftentimes you get uh, a, a, um, a president who wants to do something and then starts the debate. This debate started much more at the grassroots level about wh why were people paying so much for their drugs and what could we uh, do about it. Uh, president Clinton did, as a result of this enormous increase in concern, propose coverage under Medicare for prescription drugs. He proposed it along the lines uh, of other Medicare services, where Medicare would establish the rates, just as Medicare establishes the rates for hospitals and physicians and other health care providers. That bill did not go anywhere, but somewhere along the line, the Republicans who were uh, in control of the Congress, in the House particularly for the first time in 40 years, said, well, they had to do something, especially after they had closed down the government and were found to be a little uh, unpopular with the American people that they really didn't do anything except uh, uh, stop things from functioning. Uh, they said they, in those days they wanted to show an accomplishment. In these days they take pride in shutting down the government and stopping things from happening. And uh, to show an accomplishment, the Republicans decided they'll take this issue away from the Democrats. They'll devise a Part D for Medicare to pay for prescription drugs, but they'll do it in a unique way. And the unique way that they devised was that we would have private insurance companies making the decision about the uh, payment uh, for pharmaceuticals, not the Medicare system. So people would have to buy a private pharmaceutical plan uh, for Part D, either through a separate insurance company or if they had a, a managed care plan, the managed care plan would provide pharmaceutical coverage. And they uh, wrote it in there that there can be no negotiation on the, on the prices by the government, which was a very strange notion because suddenly we're going to have a payer paying for millions of new drugs, millions of drugs that were already on the market, and we were not going to use the the leverage of all those new payers, uh, the, uh, leverage of all those new customers to get a better price. But the Republicans decided they didn't want to do that. They wanted to protect the pharmaceutical companies and they wanted to uh, bring in the insurance companies and at the same time uh, try to, to uh, show that they were going to produce for the seniors, not the Democrats. So we had the unusual situation where the Republicans had to pass this bill. Democrats, by and large, were against it. There was some crossover, uh, and uh, part of the crossover was in the Senate, where uh, uh, the, in the Senate Finance Committee, which has jurisdiction over these uh, matters, Senator Grassley was the chairman, Senator Baucus was the ranking member, and they had a tradition of bipartisanship, which generally meant that Senator Baucus went along with Senator Grassley when he was in power. <laughs> but when it came, however, to the Affordable Care Act, uh, I think, uh, Senator Baucus thought it would be reciprocated, but it wasn't at all. Uh, the tradition of the bipartisanship in the Senate Finance Committee didn't hold. So the bill passed uh, into law, and now it's, uh, it, it's the way seniors, for the most part, 
under Medicare, and disabled people who are part of the Medicare program get their pharmaceuticals. Um, many of us have criticized it because there is no negotiation. There's no attempt to get the best price. Defendants, defenders of the program say, well, the, the PBMs that run it for the private insurance companies do negotiate for a better price, and things have worked out well. The truth of the matter is that uh, uh, there was a historical event, and maybe you can corroborate this as a historian of this area, of this area uh, that uh, many of the drugs were coming off patent. And therefore, there are a lot more generic drugs that were a lot less expensive. So the costs that we feared that would be in Part D weren't realized, not because of the law the way it was drafted, but because of the fact that more and more drugs were uh, generic drugs. It did coincide with this major patent cliff, which was one of the one of the words in, in the, the, the the pharmaceutical industry literature. This moment in which a tremendous amount of blockbuster drugs were going off patent. Um, there's a historicity to this process of how uh, mm -hmm. uh, certain waves of drug innovation are on patent and then go off patent at the same time. Certainly was not anticipated within the planning for for, for Part D at the no, time. No, but that they. Uh, they benefited from it, uh, just as uh, a lot of people benefited from the failure of the Clinton administration's health care bill, where suddenly health care costs were restrained, but no law had been passed. Some speculated that it was in anticipation of the law being changed, mm -hmm. and then after they realized that it hadn't been changed, health care prices went back up. C can you talk for a moment about the donut hole? Uh, the donut hole, I cannot give you all the specifics, but it was, um, it was not a policy choice to create what was called the don donut hole. It was a budget choice. When the Part D bill was being enacted, we all in Congress have to abide the, by the estimates of the Congressional Budget Office. And so the Congressional Budget Office looked at the cost in the out years and realized this was going to be far more than what the Republicans had hoped to pay. So they set up a structure where when you got to a certain level of purchase of drugs <coughs> under Medicare, you would get some help. But when you got to a certain level, you were going to be on your own. And that was the whole. And then when you got to the other side, then the, then the program would pay 100% of the cost. But in between, People were paying, let's say, 20 percent of the cost for the drugs. They're now in the donut hole, and they're paying 100 percent of the cost for the drugs, which was quite a shock to people who were experiencing that. It, very unpopular, very unpopular part of the program, but it was it was solely to hold down costs, uh, not because anybody thought it was a good policy to make people pay 100 percent of the cost of their drugs after they had come up to a, a certain limit. Yeah. So. In, in recent years... It was so unpopular, by the way, that that was one of the objectives in the Affordable Care Act was to eliminate that donut hole, which uh, uh, we're in the process of uh, phasing out. Or filling with some better filling. Uh, I, 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 there's, there's so many bad puns about the donut hole out there. <laughs> uh, uh, it, but in recent years, certainly, certainly in the past few months, we've become very aware of pharmaceutical pricing, and it seems as if the prices for patent-protected brand name pharmaceuticals continue to spiral higher and higher, um, up against some ceiling that we, we have not quite hit yet, some ceiling of where prices just become impossibly high. And we see less connection to the cost of manufacture or to the limitations of access and, right. and public health that high cost of drugs provide, um, most egregiously in the case of hepatitis C as Jerry was referring to earlier. And I, I'd like to ask you, from your perspective, you've been paying attention to this for a while, You've seen drug increases over many points in time, but why have we seen such rampant price escalation in the past 10 years? This recent escalation seems even more dramatic than in other eras. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Well, uh, the, um, the development of a, um, of a specialty drug, oftentimes drugs for small patient populations, has allowed manufacturers to see a potential for profit that they didn't foresee in the 1980s when we adopted the Orphan Drug Act because there were uh, people suffering from what were called rare diseases, small patient populations, and the drug companies would say, if I make a drug for that patient population, that I'm not going to get a real full profit 
out of it because there aren't going to be that many purchasers. So they were looking for more Me Too drugs, big seller drugs for a large patient population. And we passed an Orphan Drug Act because people who had those diseases were con considered themselves orphans. Nobody was paying attention to them. To give them more incentives, some tax breaks, but, but what turned out to even be more significant, an additional period of exclusivity. And that additional uh, period of exclusivity has been the magnet for a lot of companies who've now come to the conclusion if they can develop a drug for the small population, as long as they have insurance coverage, they can just charge as much as they want. And oftentimes when the individual didn't have insurance coverage, they give them the drug. But the fact that insurance is there to pay for it has been a strong incentive for the pipeline of, of new drugs to move toward uh, this niche area. Uh, I've, I've read some sources that say that it's not the, 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 the specialty drugs, uh, which of course are sometimes for small patient populations, but also for uh, hepatitis C, which is for a very large patient population that has driven up uh, prices for those drugs to the point where we don't quite know what to do since the primary payer for a lot of people who get hepatitis C is the Medicaid program, and, uh, and the states can't imagine how they're going to continue, nor can Medicare even see how they can continue paying the cost for uh, uh, Salvati or other drugs. But um, there's another factor, too. A lot of the companies that already have their drugs out, they're on the market, they're just raising the rates every year. There seems to be no connection to the price of the drugs and the actual investment for the development of the drug. Since so many of these drugs we're talking about have already been out, they've already, uh, the companies have already been selling it for a period of time, they've recouped their investments, they've recouped a, a generous profit, but nobody looks at what is the proper amount of money they should get, it's just they're entitled to whatever they can get. So we hear more about the specialty drugs and less and less about just the steady increase that those who have a, a patent or exclusivity uh, put on drugs that are already on the market. Yeah. So um, I, 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 have, I have one more question for you. And this okay. is it, the Hatch-Waxman Act has been hailed as, as, a, as a remarkable example of bipartisan legislation and one of the strongest example of bipartisan legislation in, in living memory. And right now, um, you know, Really, this week, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle and, and both houses of Congress are actively taking up prescription drug pricing, again, as a key acting, action mm -hmm. issue, par mm -hmm. partly around the question of generic drug prices. Um, and I, I'd like to ask, what, what lessons can this Congress take from your experience about the bipartisan basis of pharmaceutical policy making around price and access? And in this election year, with so much at stake in the fall, what do you think is the likelihood that this Congress can take meaningful action on the topic of drug pricing? This in Congress this year or the, the next Congress? Um, I, I mean right now this right year, now. but I'm also interested in the next. But okay. yeah, in the, in, in, the, in the months or, or year to come. Well, we had a lot of concern in, about prices in the 1980s. And, um, and, and the, the issue was important to, uh, to people, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they wanted something done. But it wasn't, uh, it, wasn't it wasn't until the pharmaceutical companies, the, in those days it wasn't called pharma, it was the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, the PMA, decided to enter into this agreement for the Hatch-Waxman framework that we're able to move it forward. Um, and that was tremendously important because even though a lot of Republicans and Democrats would talk against high prices for drugs and show a great deal of sympathy to their constituents who had to pay that price, they weren't really to buck the PMA. The generic industry was split at the time. They weren't much of a factor. There were even two generic uh, trade associations. They were fighting with each other. But um, that's what made the difference. And just as a side story, the head of the PMA was a fellow named Lou Engman. And he thought it made sense to do this win-win deal and was part of the negotiations on the basic framework. And the rest of the negotiations were with some of the companies who wanted to come in with what's in their pipeline, what's leaving their pipeline, uh, tweaking the, the, the law uh, 
to take in consideration certain individual factors. And we finally passed the law, and one of the first things the PMA did was to fire Lou Engman. And ironically enough, he then later went to work for the, the uh, Generic Pharmaceutical Association. Uh, recently, we had the situation with the ACA, where my former colleague Billy Tozen, representing the pharma, decided to aggressively help the Obama administration on the Affordable Care Act and made sure that they were very protected. Not only would they get a large number of new people being able to afford drugs because they'd have a payer for drugs uh, as, they, uh, as their insurance companies would uh, be required to pay for some of these drugs. Uh, he wrote a lot of things in there. And some of the biggest things I objected to in the ACA were things we gave away to pharma. He did a terrific job representing pharma. And after that was over, he went back to pharma, and they were angry with him because they felt very close to the Republicans, and the Republicans were so angry that P uh, the pharma helped uh, move forward the, uh, the ACA. So uh, it, it's not a secure job to become the head of pharma <laughs> and do anything. <laughs> A lot of people have been the head of pharma and, um, and just protect what they have, and that seems to be, I don't know, I don't know about the history of it, but that seems to me a safer, safer job security. But um, uh, it, it is tough. Pharma is a very powerful force, and when we had the issue of whether the generics for biologics would get 12 years where small molecules uh, got an extra five years, so from 5 to 12, that seemed like a huge giveaway. And um, even President Obama said, I, I can't go for that. He wanted it much lower. But when the political circumstances put the ACA in the hands of every Democratic senator having to vote for it in order to get 60 votes, the president had to give up and say, well, we'll have to go with 12 years. i got to get the bill through. Even though he didn't want it, I didn't want it. It was a mistake that we'll have to correct at some future time. But sometimes you just, the timing is right. And pharma and bio were able to get uh, an outrageous 12-year exclusivity on top of their patent for uh, generic biologics, which, by the way, is the wave of the future. I know we're running out of time because I see our hook. But <laughs> not, I think 80%, at least plus, of drugs in this country are uh, generic, and it has meant a huge break for the payers for that, uh, those drugs uh, as a result of the Hatch-Waxman Act. But the high-cost drugs that we're looking at now are uh, the, the, the biologic drugs the, and others where, uh, uh, where, where the pharmaceutical industry has been very clever in figuring out the, a new direction to take. And, uh, Whatever is designed, we can be assured of somebody on all sides of the question trying to figure out how to take the law and move it in or twist it to serve uh, their individual interests. Well, thank you for sharing your insight okay. and experience with us, Congressman Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Me, thank you as well. Um, this has been a great start. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Caleb Alexander, who's an associate professor in the uh, Department of Epidemiology, and I've got to get this title right, um, essentially the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Drug Safety and Effectiveness. Um, and he, along with a number of doctoral students, have been essentially putting together this list of policy issues that are on the agenda for today. And you need a little assistance. Yeah, that would be great. And are we moving the table or no? No. Okay. Do you need it? Yeah, it's just, I mean, I, I, think I have the, slides, I think but. Susan's uh, got it set up so okay. that it'll go right over the table. Terrific. Great, thank you. And I'm mic I presume? Yes, just, mic. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I hope all of you can see, and it's a privilege to be here and be able to present the results of this work. Uh, and it has been a team effort. 
I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper, Jeremy Balreich and Mariana Sokal and Taruja Karmarkar, who are all doctoral students in the Department of Health Policy and Management, Antonio Trujillo, Jeremy Green, Josh Sharfstein, and, and Jerry Anderson. So the problem of drug pricing, if we, as we've already heard a little bit, is, is both old and new. And if it wasn't old, I wouldn't have 48 proposals to share with you today that we've identified that have already been proposed. Uh, but if it wasn't new, we wouldn't be talking about it and wouldn't be having a symposium here uh, devoted to these issues. The U.S. consistently spends more on branded products and pays more, pays higher prices than other countries. Uh, as you've heard from Jerry's opening comments, spending is approaching $400 billion annually. Uh, rates of growth are now in the double digits, over 10%. Uh, this is a graphic of total pharmaceutical spending per capita in seven countries in 2000 and 2010. And the U.S. is the top set of bars, so the blue bar is 2000 and the red bar is 2010. And you can see pretty much any metric you use, spending is higher. Uh, per capita, and we pay more uh, per products than any other country around the world. There are lots of different products we could be talking about, and uh, Congressman Waxman's uh, recent comments were a nice setup in terms of flagging in particular biologics or specialty products. Biologics, as you may know, are products that are derived from living cells. They account for about 1% of prescription drugs by volume and nearly a third of all prescription drug spending. And this fraction is going to increase over time. Uh, here is a select group of U.S. branded biologics that are expected to reach blockbuster status by 2019. And you can see that the price tags aren't, aren't pretty. So Opdivo for melanoma, the expected price $150,000 a year, and Tresto for congestive heart failure, $4,600 a year, or Canby for cystic fibrosis, $260,000 a year, and the list goes on. Now, we could debate what these numbers mean, and indeed part of the message that I'll give is that uh, we don't know, and uh, you'll, you'll be, or that it's difficult to tell, perhaps I should say, and, and we'll certainly be hearing more about what, what a price means and, and, and what a price represents during uh, comments throughout today's symposium. But, these, um, uh, uh, but suffice it to say that these are uh, the types of products that are capturing the focus of uh, public payers, uh, private uh, commercial plans, and the general public alike. So for public programs, we've heard a little bit about this already. Uh, hep C is a nice case study. So here, uh, recall uh, Jerry Anderson's comments at the outset that you have uh, very safe and efficacious products that are reaching fewer than 10% of the eligible population. Uh, among some populations, fewer than 3% of eligible patients are getting, these, uh, getting treated with these drugs. Uh, Medicare spending on hepatitis C products increased from $300 million in 2013 to $4.5 billion in 2014. So $300 million to $4.5 billion. Uh, consumers aren't happy either. I'm not going to steal uh, Patricia Newman's thunder, so I'm not going to tell you all the data about consumers, but, but I promise you, consumers are really concerned about the magnitude of uh, drug prices and what it means for their access to products. And uh, if you want another indication, uh, in addition to the fact that we'll see some very nice data that was generated by the Kaiser Health Tracking Poll, uh, take, a, take, uh, uh, take a look at the presidential candidates and the fact that pharmaceutical companies and drug pricing is making it to the list of debate topics. So there are four unresolved or sort of partially resolved empirical questions that are really important because they influence policy debates. And so I'd like to review each of these in turn. The first is what's the cost of developing a new drug? There's no question that there's tremendous investment in R&D, that it's expensive to develop products, and that most drugs in the pipeline fail. But there is a lot of debate over the exact cost and variation in cost of developing a drug. And so we have estimates as little as $0.8 billion and as high as $5 billion. 
these estimates are based on proprietary data, and so there's, there, there's a lot of controversy around them and the assumptions that are made when one derives these estimates, but building consensus regarding the true cost of drug development is precluded by a lack of transparency on the part of manufacturers regarding their R&D costs and on the part of researchers that are using proprietary data and making their own assumptions about how to manage different costs that may be included, such as taxes and write-offs and the input costs of, of capital. And so some states have pursued legislation, are, are currently pursuing legislation to gather this information, that is the cost that firms are investing in R&D. And in fact, the president's 2017 budget requests money to collect this information as well. A second important question is what's the relationship between revenue and R&D? This is important to know because proposals to reduce drug prices are often met with concern about the, the effect that those types of reductions will have on declining R&D, that is in decreasing the amount of investment that manufacturers are making in research and development and thus hurting future, the, the prospect for future drug innovation. Currently, it's estimated that large manufacturers spend between 14 and 20 percent of, uh, of their revenues on R&D. There's at least one estimate in the literature that suggests that a 10 percent increase in price is associated with a 6 percent increase in R&D. But the precise association between revenue and R&D is unclear as is the association between greater R&D and greater production of innovative products. This latter point is important because policies that argue for more R&D as the method for increasing competition and lowering drug prices need to be able to show the association between R&D spending on the one hand and innovative drugs on the other. The third empiric question that is, um, uh, you know, this one is maybe, I, at least I feel a little bit more comfortable venturing here than, than, than the first two, is what value do drugs provide? And, and the short answer here I would suggest is it, it depends. Um, there's no question that many pharmaceuticals provide tremendous value, consider insulins or vaccine or treatments for cardiovascular therapies. I think there's also little question that many drugs provide little to no value. And many government organizations outside the U.S. use cost effectiveness in deliberation. So, for example, you may be familiar with the U.K.'s National Institute for Health and Care Excellence or Germany's Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare, ICWIG. Um, but Congress has restricted PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, from including cost effectiveness in evaluations of drugs. And thus, in the United States, we have no uniform approach to measuring the value of specific drugs. The last unresolved or sort of contested empiric question is whether the private market can generate a reasonable price. And I think here there's reason to be skeptical, uh, a variety of reasons to be skeptical. So patents create time-limited monopolies, and so firms essentially become price setters, but they're also profit maximizers. And so this means that pharmaceutical companies set prices that maximize their profits, and these prices may be too high for many patients to afford, as we've heard, or they may not reflect the value that products provide. But there are many other lines of evidence as well that I think raise concern about how well the market is functioning. So for example, uh, the absence of price transparency uh, because of confidentiality agreements and because of information asymmetry between prescribers and patients. Prices for drugs also don't follow usual economic behavior. So economists will re refer to this as inelastic demands, meaning that consumers are relatively indifferent to price increases. There are also other ways that prices don't function as one might expect in a normal market. They don't vary with dose. When a new competitor comes onto the market, it's not uncommon for the price of the existing product to increase rather than decrease. Uh, there's widespread price discounting, or there's widespread discounting, which suggests price discrimination, and prices may shift quickly for reasons that have very little to do with uh, changes in the input cost of making a product. 
And also prices don't correspond with value or with the amount of R&D invested in a given product. So these four questions, what's the cost of bringing a product to market? What's the relationship between revenue and R&D? Can the market um, generate, what value do drugs provide? And can the market generate a reasonable price? These four questions we'll hear uh, again throughout today's symposium. And the greater the consensus regarding the answers to these questions, the better that specific policy proposals can be evaluated. So next, I'd like to shift to discussing the proposals that we identified. Uh, and we have 48, and I have about 10 minutes left. So that would be 12 and a half seconds per proposal. <laughs> So I'm not going to try to cover all 48. What I'm going to do is going to provide a high-level overview of the 48 proposals that we've identified. And in terms of how we identified them, suffice it to say that we combined expert opinion with an iterative structured literature review. And here, again, I want to give a special thanks and acknowledgement to Jeremy and Mariana and Taruja, who carried out and led this effort. So the first set of proposals are focused on the patent system. And the, the problem here, or the problem that these proposals are trying to address is to strike a better balance between incentives for innovation on the one hand and establishing a price, a fair price, a price that's fair through either eliminating patents or changing the patent life. And there are a number of different examples of solutions that fall into this category. So for example, empowering the government to purchase patents at auction and placing them in the public domain. Strengthening the criteria for issuing patents. Reforming or prohibiting payment patent settlements. I think Congressman Waxman referred to those as pay to play or pay to delay. The idea here is that one firm pays another to delay the second firm's entry into the market. And last but not least, varying the patent life or market exclusivity based on degree of drug innovation. So these are the types of proposals, these are examples of proposals that have been forwarded by others uh, during the past one or two decades in an effort to try to address the high costs of many prescription drugs. A second set of proposals is focused on encouraging research to drive drug development. And the problem here is that the supply of new drugs is a function of investment in R&D. Currently, we rely on a quasi-public-private funding mechanism where the NIH funds a large amount of basic science research and pharmaceutical companies uh, build on that information and take products through the clinical development uh, uh, pathway. And fewer drugs means fewer, less competition. So the goal here is to increase competition by increasing drug development. So examples of solutions here are using prizes to spur the development of innovative drugs, financing clinical drug development through competing publicly supported research centers, providing public funding of clinical trials, and establishing agreement among countries to fund international research outside of US patent laws. A third set of proposals is focused on the FDA, which of course regulates pharmaceuticals, the problem here is that it's, it's expensive for companies to get their drugs approved, and regulatory thresholds pose a large burden. So these solutions include establishing reciprocity with overseas authorities. So essentially, companies could use uh, uh, the, 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 re the drug review of a product in the Europe, say, by the EMA, and then apply that and gain market access in the United States. Creating an international agency to oversee orphan drug development modifying evidentiary standards for approval. Uh, I do a lot of work with the FDA, and I find this one particularly interesting because there are proposals both to increase the thresholds and decrease the thresholds. So um, some arguments are to, you know, some argue to decrease the thresholds. This might make it cheaper to bring a product to market, and therefore firms could lower the prices because they'd have less prices to recoup, less costs 
to recover based on the investments of um, making it through the regulatory pathway. Uh, conversely, some have argued to increase regulatory thresholds. For example, if the FDA incorporated greater use of the principles of comparative effectiveness during the course of drug review, at the time a product reached the market, we'd have much more knowledge about the appropriate role of the product in the, the appropriate place of the product in clinical practice. Uh, we'd essentially uh, have much more information about how to apply the product in ways that truly deliver value. A last proposal is to allow for reimportation of products from other countries. A fourth set of pr proposals focuses on decreasing market demand. And the problem here is that physicians write prescriptions, so patients' demand curves are not always considered. Most patients have insurance, patents grant monopolies, and there's a lack of price transparency in the industry. So solutions that are focused on decreasing market demand include building cost information into the clinical workflow, incorporating value information into clinical guidelines, eliminating drug coupons, altering insurance coverage or marketing policies, using risk-sharing contracts or value-based insurance designs, or stricter regulations regarding direct-to-consumer advertising. And then the last group of proposals is focused on developing innovative pricing policies. So here the problem is that drug prices are not transparent and it's unclear how they're set. Monopolies for branded drugs interfere with the market and the challenge is determining what constitutes a fair price for a drug. So some of the proposed solutions here are empowering the federal government to negotiate a single price. We heard a little about this. Using value-based pricing based on marginal clinical benefit determining a fair price based on disease severity, treatment alternatives, cost to patients, social value, and establishing a ceiling price or regulations that would restrict the amount of price growth. So we've reviewed five groups of uh, uh, policies then, revising the patent system, encouraging research to increase the development of drugs, altering pharmaceutical regulation, decreasing market demand, and developing innovative pricing strategies. These policies have to be evaluated, and they're not equal, of course, and we've begun considering ways that one might evaluate the relative merits of different policies. Here are some possible criteria that one might use. These may not be necessary nor sufficient, but I'll let you just take a quick look at them uh, for yourselves. One or two comments here. The first is that there's some subjectivity here, right? I mean, there's uncertainty that, that bounds estimates of any of these. If you take something like allowing Medicare to bargain uh, or to negotiate a single price, what's the likelihood that that will have unintended consequences? We could debate that. Or what's the likelihood that that would incentivize or have a deleterious impact on incentivizing drug companies to invest in R&D? And another point I'd make is just that uh, these policies may not be adopted one by one, and evaluating a group of policies is different than evaluating any single policy. And the third point is that uh, you can't have it all. So I'm going to tell you that on the next slide also, but I'll tell it to you twice. There's no policy that you run through these types of criteria where you see that it's a win, 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 win. So, um, so policymakers have some real work to do. So in summary, we identified 48 unique proposals to reduce the costs of U.S. branded prescription drugs. The more consensus we achieve on a few key empirical questions, the easier it will be to compare different policy solutions. There are several criteria that can be applied to judge any proposed policy. And once again, no policy is going to have it all, and policymakers are going to have to trade off a variety of competing interests and demands. So thank you for the opportunity to share this work uh, with all of you. I really didn't believe that he would able, be able to pull it off, but he did. Thank you, Caleb. Um, I'm going to introduce the next three speakers uh, so that they can come up right after each other. First one is coming up right now is Antonio Trujillo. He's a, uh, an associate professor in the Department of International Health, works a lot on uh, consumers and how they deal with chronic conditions. We will, um, and what he, we've asked him to do, along with a number of people, is to come up with a 
a survey looking at fair pricing and understanding it. And a number of you who are students in this uh, room participated in the survey, and thank you for doing so. Um, the next, I will turn to Michael Sue, who's a first year, or now a second year medical student, had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to work with him this summer, uh, and we talked about a variety of policy issues, and he decided that he was most interested in the whole issue of patents and that, so you're going to hear from him about patents. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Josh Sharstein, um, and Josh has had a whole series of uh, jobs. He was the deputy uh, uh, commissioner for the FDA. He was the commissioner of health. Um, he's now professor of the practice and associate dean at the school here. All of us in this room know Josh. Um, and what he is interested in is sort of putting a public health perspective on the whole issue of drug pricing. So I'll have to explain that. And then Joseph Rattugi and I um, have been working on the whole issue of bundling. So at the end, I will come up and talk about the whole issue of bundling. With that, I will turn it over to Antonio and we will get the technology working for you. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Jerry, for a nice introduction. Um, well, before I start, uh, you know, I wanted to acknowledge the team. This is not just my work, but it's a work in collaboration with some students and some of my colleagues. Uh, so the, the, the challenge for me was to, to solve the issue of what means fairness. Uh, uh, you know, we already have two presentations, and people use words like fair already, reasonable, affordable. So the question for us was, okay, what means fairness? How can we assess that a price of a drug is fair? And to answer that subjective question, what we did was to develop uh, a survey. So you, you can think about uh, using a very simple example that Jerry loved, which is what if you know snow and people increase the price of the snow shuffle uh, right after the snow? That is that fair or not? Some people will say, and maybe economists will be included in there, let the price signal, let the market work, let the price signal prospectively. So if you increase a lot the prices, so smart people will come and compete and reduce the price or create something new. So that is fair and, and let the market work. But some other people may say, no, wait a second, it's not fair to gouge the price. So we use that word also, gouge the price, because there are not an option uh, to, um, buy another, uh, there is not another place where I can buy because it was not my fault, there's no. We try to have this notion of fairness embedded in our brain, but we, we need a more conceptual framework to answer that question, but there are some people who will use the word not, it's not fair, you are gouging the price, you should not do that. So what we tried to do was to answer that question and some people already said, well, pharmaceutical drugs try to maximize price, uh, profit, and they use different techniques, they use techniques to a differentiate price according to consumer willingness to pay. They use uh, pricing according to the return of the investment of that medicine. They, they try to price medicine higher, they, they higher the value. They use others, a lot of things. The question was, where is fairness in that picture? Uh, they try to combine prices with access and be worried about that, but where is fairness? And, and the fairness is very common in different sectors. Typical, housing. It's fair that I'm paying 20% of my income in housing. It's fair to pay the prices of oil, of the gasoline, 3.8 per, ga per, per gallon. So we have that concept a lot. So the question is how can we formalize in, in, the, in, the, in the prescription drug sector? Uh, so in order to answer that question, what we try is to use a conceptual framework developed by a psychology, which I think is more an economist, Kahneman, a long time ago. And then behavioral economists build it up on that notion, the notion of fairness. How can we assess that? And, and they came up with the, the basic theory is the dual entitlement. So the question is how you entitle rights to assess fairness. And in order to entitle rights to assess fairness, you, you, you look at three things. Reference transaction mean, is there any other good available. If there is not available good, increasing price may not be fair. 
what is the reference price of the substitute? If I'm paying $100 per, per something and now it's 300, it may not be fair. But if I pay 200 and now it's 300 or 250, it may be fair. So the notion of your reference, the notion of availability of reference, it's used to entitle rights. Outcomes, outcome of participant. If I set it up this price, only 10% of the people will use it. Which people will use it? Those people who have higher income, higher education, those people who can get in the line sooner. It's fair that we leave some people out the outside. Those are the questions that we try to entitle here. And the last issue is, what are the circumstances? The snowstorm, it was outside everyone. The increases in salary of my employees that reduce my profit may be something that I could have controlled. So how do we balance all these three issues? So let me give you an example because the problem is that if all those things happen at the same time, then you're going to have an explosion. And that's what happened with the data prime uh, case a few months ago. Because you have a drug who was $13, he increased it to 700 You didn't have a competition or anything that you can substitute because the market from outside cannot come in. You don't have any apparent reason to the increase. So in order to, to uh, set it up whether or not it was fair, we used this argument in some way to assess that what this guy did was an explosion. On top of that, the guy is not very pleasant and he <laughs> like rap and all of that, but I don't care about that. What I care is that it was an explosion. The entitlement process give us a way of thinking about that, and we could have figured out that it was a bad policy to increase the price using this, this issue. So what we did was to, as I said, develop a, a survey trying to use this dual entitlement theory, and uh, all of the elements that are the, in these three levels, and ask people about it. So we start with graduate student, and as Jerry said, thank you so much to all the students who answer our survey, and our plan is to move forward to ask general public, and general public who consume medicine, general public who do not consume medicine, general public who have the disease, to see if they are wanted to balance these entitlements in different ways. So people with diabetes may have a different perception because the trade-off may be different. So going over the results. Well, the first result was, you know, we used the, the word reasonable, and we also have in the survey the word fair, but 81% saying that the prices are not reasonable or fair. And we use this question in order to test how close we are from the Kaiser Foundation uh, 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 health tracking survey, and, and we are pretty close. So the student here seems to resemble this, this opinion that this perception that prices are not fair, so not reasonable. So the question, the second question is, okay, what is driving these prices? What are driving these prices high? And what are the, what are the keeping forces that are pushing them up? And it seems to be that R&D, as uh, Caleb was suggesting, it may be one thing to pay attention. But the other thing is how we design the system and who is paying for that, and the public insurance system paying for that, not having a budget constraint, maybe a force to high prices. And and that's what we, it's, it's reflected in, 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 this, in the survey. The next issue is the value proposition. And it seems to me that a lot of people believe that we can have a value proposition, a three holes to decide whether or not to pay for that. But the interesting thing to us is there is not much agreement about where do we stop paying. 150,000, 250 per value per drug. It's what our respondent is suggesting. So there is a three holes, but th there's a cutoff, but there is not a specific value where we should stop, where it should not be fair to cover because we're gonna give up other goods. So getting into the issues of why people perceive that prices are unfair, it seems to be that what we are getting from the, the theory of uh, dual entitlement, it's playing a role in here. Um, access, people cannot afford, low income people and a specific group that we care and we incorporate into our preference are not getting the drugs. Uh, but there is also seen that um, the father people are, companies are maximizing profit are also perceived as a reason for the current level of prices to be unfair. 
But moving to the question, not to the current level of prices, but changes in prices, or how do you perceive a scenarios of changes in prices as a fair or not, it also resembles a little bit of what the theory of dual entitlement will, uh, will predict. If you take a flu, uh, a flu season, uh, during the flu season, and you increase the price of a very needed drug, people may perceive that as a really unfair move. If the company writes the price of a drug where you don't have a lack of another alternative, okay, people may perceive that of a, of a drug. Uh, uh, they may perceive that as a unfair. So the last issue is also related to the alternative. So it's consistent, the, the idea of fairness in, in this uh, story. Um, for the sake of time, I got to go quickly here, but we also surveyed the opinion of people about policies in order to see how the policies that we're going to be talking later uh, are perceived by the public. And, and as we can see, there are a consensus about you know, R&D, empowering consumer, and designing the incentive of the insurance payment better. So in conclusion, uh, I think this is a very important topic, the, the topic of how, as a public, we perceive fairness and how policymakers can introduce in their design of policy the criteria of fairness in a more systematic way. The second issue is that this, uh, this uh, dual entitlement theory seems to predict how people will react to fairness. And if we have the explosion of all these elements, you're going to have higher level of unfairness and higher level of uh, unhappiness. Affordability is a clear issue in, in fairness. And again, if we incorporate fairness in the design of public policy, we may have policies that are better received by the public. So with that, I. I will show to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd first like to begin by acknowledging my colleague, Dr. Ali Thaver, and my mentor, Dr. Anderson. Um, and for the next 10 minutes, I'll be talking about a new policy idea to address the high prices of specialty drugs, um, targeting the exclusivity period for pharmaceuticals. So I'd like to begin the conversation first by talking about Sivaldi. And as many of you probably have heard of this drug, it's a curative treatment for hepatitis C, a chronic liver disease that infects more than 3 million Americans. Despite the curative properties of this drug, many Americans are not able to get it due to the high price of the drug, $84,000 for a 12-week daily course of treatment. And due to the high price, we see limited access for this drug to many Americans. And this limited access um, can be felt across the payer landscape. For example, state Medicaid programs are often rationing these drugs to only uh, the patients that have uh, shown the most uh, progressed liver disease or more severe liver disease. Patients under Medicare often have to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket to pay for these drugs, which oftentimes can be unaffordable. And across the VA or Department of Defense, uh, many patients are unable to get on this drug because, again, the high price. And for the VA, less than 15% as of last December of patients that have hepatitis C were able to get a treatment, one of the new antiviral treatments for hepatitis C. And Sovaldi is not alone. It's not the only high price specialty drug currently in the market or that will be coming on the market. Currently, there are many drugs um, in the oncology field or in the hematology field that cost more than $100,000 per year per course of treatment. We also see new drugs such as the PCSK9 um, treatments for cardiovascular diseases for uh, familial hyperlipidemia that are projected to be cost around fourteen dollars to $17,000 a year. And these are not curative treatments. So the, these patients could potentially be on these drugs every year for the rest of their lives. So you can imagine the amount of uh, cost that could be to the healthcare system. And when one is trying to assess or come up with a new policy solution to address uh, the high price specialty drugs, uh, we need to um, accommodate both uh, the idea of trying to increase patient access, but also continuing to encourage 
pharmaceutical innovation at the same time. And the area that we targeted for our uh, proposed uh, solution is market exclusivity. And I just wanted to give a quick overview of the market exclusivity of a drug, and that is broken down into two components. Uh, one is the patent life of the drug, which is given to a drug by the US Patent and Trade Office, which is often around 20 years, plus or minus some. And the other is the market exclusivity period, which is given by the FDA, uh, which, um, which is the period of time that the drug is given uh, market exclusivity rights. And this was created, as um, uh, Congressman Watchman uh, discussed before, uh, to um, allow for the, the creation of the generic drug market. And we're going to be focusing on the latter, the FDA uh, bestowed uh, market exclusivity period. And something to remind ourselves of is that the purpose of the market exclusivity period or the patent life of the drug is to allow the company enough time to recoup um, their R&D investments into a drug. And with this in mind, then the next question is, is it fair then that different drugs with uh, widely varying um, R&D costs have the same or similar market exclusivity periods. And we argue that drugs that have a, have a lot of uh, R&D or required a lot of investment to the drug should have a higher market exclusivity period. And drugs that, uh, for example, are more profitable earlier on in their uh, market life or are able to recoup their R&D costs quicker should have um, a shortened ex exclusivity period. And to summarize these points, um, essentially our policy idea is that the market exclusivity period would allow a company to earn a multiple of its R&D in profits before it's terminated. And this multiple would be determined by Congress. And the R&D that is mentioned here includes both the R&D for the successful trials of getting the drug out on market, as well as the R&D uh, required um, that went into the failed clinical trials that companies invested in. So therefore, companies have a decision to make when they launch a drug um, into the market. Either they set a higher price and therefore have a shorter market exclusivity period, or set a lower price and have a longer exclusivity period. That's sort of the simplified version of it. Now, there are advantages and limitations to a policy such as this. One advantage, of course, is that it will improve access um, in the sense that drugs will, have, will be on a market exclusivity period until they've recouped enough profits to make back a multiple of their R&D. So once they've already done that, um, the, the drug will lose its market exclusivity rights and therefore uh, will enter the generic market and this will help improve access for this drug to many patients. Another is that it'll, reward, it'll still reward game-changing drugs as uh, this can be um, a simple amendment to this uh, policy it could be that um, there would be a minimum exclusivity period that all drugs would get and therefore drugs that are more profitable can easily make a lot of profit in the beginning for the first, for example, five years before it loses exclusivity. So it'll still reward drugs that are very profitable. And it'll encourage true innovation, that is, innovation into drugs that require a lot of R&D investment um, that are not necessarily copycat drugs, though copycat drugs are important to our pharmaceutical industry. Some limitations are that um, it'll require corporate transparency, which currently is not the case, uh, it required companies to be able to report their drug-specific R&D costs to the FDA or to the uh, governing reporting body. Another limitation is that it's slightly more complex than the current system. And finally, some may deem it as being over-regulation. Uh, however, one thing uh, we need to remember is that um, the current system is set up um, with the government intervention already in place of an exclusivity period and a patent period that allows for a monopoly to take place um, in this industry. So then the question is just what, whether this exclusivity period is fair or not. And steps are required uh, in order to effectively implement this policy option. Uh, one uh, step that is needed is that there will need to be a reporting system for, these, uh, co for pharmaceutical companies to report their drug-specific R&D costs. Um, again, as I mentioned, cost transparency is important as well. Um, and this is already being seen across uh, several states um, in the U.S. That, um, where state legislators have pushed, uh, for example, in Massachusetts, California, and Pennsylvania for greater cost transparency and what costs are going into uh, drug innovation. And finally, uh, generic companies will need to know when a drug will go off patent or go off exclusivity. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Thank you very much.
Great, thank you so much. Uh, what an interesting set of ideas. I'm going to maybe take a little bit of a step back and, and talk from a public health perspective about drug pricing. And so, you know, I take, you take a look at what's going on with uh, prescription drugs and you can see a vicious circle, um, particularly for new branded, potentially very valuable drugs that come out at a very high price. And the vicious circle is you have a high price which then causes uh, payers to restrict access, um, which can sometimes actually stimulate even higher prices, and you wind up with the patient losing coming and going. It's sort of, you don't, it's a high price, plus the, you don't have access. And if it's an important um, public health drug, like hepatitis C uh, treatments are, because they cure hepatitis C, then it's um, particularly bad for the public because um, you wind up with significant access restrictions. Very few of the people who need the medication get it. And when you're talking particularly about an infectious disease, then um, you're not getting the value of the treatment. And um, you wind up uh, with this weird situation where only a few percentage, uh, a small percentage of the population is treated at high cost forever instead of actually uh, dealing with uh, the problem and getting the benefits of reduction in infectious disease transmission. So um, you get less, ac less access for patients, and you get potential uh, harm to public health from the vicious circle. I think it's also true for non-infectious diseases, particularly those that affect a lot of people, um, where there would be benefits to people's prolonged uh, uh, time in the workplace, um, less uh, burden on caregivers who have to take time off of work. So if you're thinking about drug pricing from a public health perspective, you're not just thinking about the individual patient, you're saying, what would a smart policy on access to drugs look like? And um, uh, I would say that the key public health question is what's the right level of access to promote the health of the population? And instead of having a vicious circle where it's higher prices, less access, think about a virtuous circle where it's lower prices and more access, needed access, to get the health benefits. Um, and so think about, in, in your mind, uh, if we were to just forget about pricing for a second and say, well, who really should get the medicine and what, how would we get the best value for public health out of the new medication? What would it look like? It might look like um, a, a series of recommendations depending on the situation that I would say maybe should be uh, put together by an independent uh, group, but could include things like uh, not just reducing copays and tiering, um, but providing uh, the testing that may be necessary to figure out who uh, needs the medicine, supporting training for clinicians to provide it, um, even conducting special outreach. So if a drug is really necessary and helpful, then an appropriate role for a payer may be just, you know, less, um, maybe more than just being passive, may actually be to um, support use. In public health, we're comfortable with that for certain medications, uh, such as vaccines. Um, I will also mention that recommendations could include concerns of inappropriate use. So you could have a medication that really works in uh, one population and could cause public health harm in another. And so as you think about what the right policy would be, it might be um, to very much encourage and promote access in one area but not in another. Because again, we're thinking about the overall health of the population. So um, this is kind of similar to, to, to some parts of, of what happens around the world. Um, if you are negotiating on behalf of an entire country's healthcare system, you're negotiating the access for the population and you're thinking about how to make it available, under what conditions, and with what level of promotion. It's also the case uh, that this is uh, how the Vaccines for Children program works, for Childhood Vaccines, a program that Congressman Waxman uh, wrote. Um, in, 19, in, the, in the early 1990s. And it, that program, um, the federal government does the purchasing for about 60% of the market. Um, but the federal government does more than just the purchasing. They promote vaccination. You know, they go around, they, there are grants to promote vaccination. There are quality measures to promote vaccination. And from the company's perspective, they have to bargain with the federal government, which, you know, is, is no fun for, for them if they have to bring down their price. But on the other hand, they get a guaranteed market um, and they get public health recommendations. So there's a trade off, a virtuous circle, lower prices, more access to the children who need the vaccines. Um, I'll give you an example from uh, the, the Bush administration. Uh, when the country needed Cipro stockpiled because of the fear of anthrax attacks, uh, the uh, Bush administration negotiated a 
group a purchase um, that was based on the idea that they would be buying for an enormous number of people and as a result get lower prices for it. So how do you bring price and volume together in a way that supports the public health? Well, I think what that means for the private sector is that you go beyond um, just the, the uh, we won't put it on a high tier um, if there's a value-based price offered by the company. Maybe there's some additional things that uh, private insurers could do to support um, the uh, appropriate use and public health benefit of medications, and that would make it even more likely for companies to lower their price. In the public sector, there are a number of ideas that are out there that are very politically um, intense, politically controversial. Allowing Medicare to negotiate the prices of uh, drugs would be one of them. Uh, using margin rights more aggressively under the Bayh-Dole Act would be another one. Um, rather than try to resolve those on their own, you might say, okay, we're going to give the federal government uh, more authority to ne more negotiating power, more ability to control prices, but only if they make needed drugs accessible to the people who need it. In the context of hepatitis C, that might look like a major outreach campaign, for example, for individuals in correctional institutions where there is an enormous uh, problem with hepatitis C. Um, I would think that under both the public and private sector, you might think more about price quantity agreements. Um, in different contexts, that could look like we will um, be prepared to pay this price, but we'll, in, in some cases, it may be because we expect this quantity. In other cases, it may be if there's a uh, adverse public health harm beyond a certain amount, the companies are going to accept much less beyond a certain price uh, quantity agreement. Um, in hepatitis C, I've, I've talked about a little bit, it would look like giving greater market power for pricing in exchange for meaningful access policies, perhaps set by the National Academy of Medicine or an independent advisory committee, um, with the result being a uh, probably some greater expenditures but lower unit costs um, and a huge benefit to public health. So in conclusion, a public health approach to drug pricing asks whether the population is healthier at the end of the day. Drug pricing itself may be too narrow a lens to look at some of these issues, think about price and access at the same time. Um, and uh, particularly, not just from a policy perspective, but also from a political perspective. This isn't just about the sticker price that a company puts on, it's also about the access policies that both the public and private payers have in access to medicines. And if you bring those together, um, perhaps you can find a, uh, more likely to find a spot uh, that would be in the end better for the health of the population. Thank you. Nick and Susan and a whole series of people have been instrumental in putting this together. And so we're just standing up here, but they've done all the work. So thanks, Nick. Thanks, Susan. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Joseph, who's been uh, helping me and has actually done most all of the work here. But I will stand up here and do the presentation uh, for both of us. And this is another policy issue that we think deserves some level of attention, which is including drugs in bundled payments. So all of you who are not experts in the whole issue of, of what Medicare and Sean, Tuna, uh, Sean Cavanaugh and others are doing in this area, they essentially have a whole set of efforts to bring in bundled payments. And bundled payments essentially are saying, we're going to provide a single payment for a whole body of services. Um, and so an example on here uh, that CMS is doing is total knee replacement. And as you can see, there's a whole series of things that are required for, to be paid for to when somebody has a total knee replacement, both during the hospitalization, getting the doctors, getting all the, the rehab physicians and all the rehab people involved in it. But what you don't see on that thing are the pharmaceuticals that are part of that bundled payment. So the question is, why not? Why are pharmaceuticals not in the bundled payment? Um, and so essentially, there's a lot of reasons why we'd want to have them in the bundled payment. 
They can offset spending for other medical services. They, they, there can be overspending when you have two separate categories. Some, you might spend too much on drugs, you might spend too little on drugs, you might spend too much on the uh, other medical services or too little on the medical services. And finally, just having them in the thing is gonna give you better clinical outcomes in many cases because the doctor who's ever making this decision is making a, a, a decision on the whole bunch of services. So why have drugs been outside of the bundle? One of it is I had an opportunity to talk to the people at, at CVS. Nobody's talking to them about bundled payments. They, they hadn't thought about the issue when we sort of brought it up to them. Um, so it's not on a lot of people's radar screen. CMS has taken a look at it, and I'll just read you, uh, or you can read the comment, but basically what they're saying is it's very difficult for us to do some pricing for this because not everybody is in Part D. And MedPAC, the, the advisory group for Congress, essentially said the same thing. It's really hard to do it. I know it's hard, but essentially this is a solvable problem. We have risk adjusters out there that CMS uses all the time. You know what the characteristics of the people that are in Part D, the people that are not in Part D. You can make adjustments for that. And then even if you can't do that, you have these actuaries that part of CMS, and they are just, they just have magic. They have fairy dust, and they can sprinkle it over, and they can come up with a reasonable price in many cases to do it. So that's a problem. That, for me, is a solvable problem. Um, so we want to look at some other problems as we thought about it, what, what CMS would have troubles. And there are two areas. One is sort of administrative char challenges that they would have in doing this, or the private sector doing this. And the second thing is getting the, the provider community to accept risk for pharmaceuticals. So the administrative th thing is how Medicare and the private sector operate. They typically have carved out the pharmaceuticals and put them in a totally different bundle of services. We heard from Henry Waxman earlier about Part D and how it's a separately operated, separately organized or whatever. So, and that's true also in the private sector with these PBMs or pharmaceutical benefit managers. They are a separate entity from what the rest of the insurance is about. Sometimes we'll have them for uh, other things like uh, for um, issues of, um, of behavioral health and whatever. But essentially, these are different things. And this makes the bundles much more challenging to do because they are a separate entity. And the first thing you could do, probably you won't do, in, certainly in the public sector, but maybe in the private sector, is eliminate the PDPs or the PBMs and have a single entity. I could go over the history of P PBMs if you wanted to, but essentially they were created uh, because we didn't know how to do with drug pricing and the managed care plans didn't. Managed care plans can do that now, so it's not as much of a challenge. So the rationale for some of these things are possible. More likely, you'd carve out the payment from the PBMs or the PDPs uh, for the average amount that a drug would cost, and that would be part of the bundle payment, and the PBM or PDP would just get a little less money as a reflection of that. Um, and so a second challenge is drug uh, regimens change easily. Um, CMS has done this for end-stage renal disease, was told to do it to this, uh, and they, they ran into some challenges. Uh, there's price increases for existing drugs. There are drug shortages. Drugs go off patent. Drug, gr new drugs enter the market. All sorts of things happen. Quite different from what happens often in taking care of post-acute care or physician care practice doesn't change as much. And so this affects the bundling. And when they did this for end-stage renal disease, they learned something they could do, learn, they, but I think these are solvable problems. Hospitals have been dealing with this issue for years. When we created the Medicare Prospective Payment System back in 1983, drugs were always part of the Medicare payment. And so, but you know, the hospitals have to deal with these new drugs all the time. And so Medicare has been quite creative in coming up with new ideas. 
they have a new medical service or technology add-on payment for the, some new drugs. They have outlier payments. They have a whole series of scenarios for hospitals, and those scenarios could be easily adapted for the Medicare, uh, to the, for bundled payments. Next thing is the concerns about quality of care, and specifically the term that we use is stinting, um, where if the bundled payment was for a certain period of time, say 60 days, maybe you wouldn't get the drug till the 61st day. And so there would be a set of incentives uh, to not provide the drugs in the period of time. Well, this has also been a concern about hospitals doing the same thing with pe prospective payment. And we saw a little bit of it in the first years, but we don't see very much of it anymore. Um, you've got to maintain the quality. You've got to do those kinds of things. And if you really were concerned about this, you could provide some practice guidelines for the bundled payment systems in order to, uh, to do this to see if they were, in fact, pro following practice guidelines. Final, next is uh, the side of providers accepting risk. And essentially here what the issue is that providers are very, know how to deal with other doctors, with home health agencies, and those behaviors are pretty predictable. The prices don't change very quickly. No, not really new markets and new products come on. No, products don't go off the market and whatever. And yes, and, and the other thing is people respond differently to drugs and not always in predictable ways. Um, so there's just greater financial risk for providers in, in this scenario. So what can we do about that? Well, there's a number of things we can do. Medicare and others have these outlier payments. They have add-on payments. They have a whole series of things so that the provider community would be able to accept this risk, these new technology. There's the whole issue of reinsurance and a whole variety of other things as well. So there's just a lot of ways that we could essentially do it. So for me, it's not surprising that the drugs are the last things to happen in these bundles. There are a lot of technical issues. There are a lot of challenges to overcome. But for me, the economic rationale and the clinical rationale for including drug in the bundled payments are so strong that I think this should be the next step in the bundled uh, process. With that, the Johns Hopkins section has, has completed. Um, we've given you four ideas to think about. Um, and now what we'd like to do is turn it over to our discussants. I'm fine. And, um, and we will, uh, the first person I'm going to turn it over is to Sean Cavanaugh. Sean is the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Centers uh, for Medicare at CMS. Uh, given that sets of responsibility, he's responsible for Part A, Part B, Part C, and Part D in the Medicare program. But before I, the most important thing about Sean is he's a graduate of Johns Hopkins. <laughs> Thank you all, and thank you, Jerry, for the introduction. Um, first of all, I'm going to apologize in advance. As soon as my remarks are over, I have to run back to the office. Um, I wish I could say, because I had thought of the solution to this problem, and I wanted to implement it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, today and every day, we'll spend about $330 million on prescription drugs at Medicare. Um, so um, it's something we think a lot about. I also want to thank you for inviting me here today. It's a it's a pleasure and somewhat of a luxury for me to be able to sit through presentations that are very thoughtful and put the work we do into some context. Having said that, um, and in the limited time, I'm really going to direct my remarks to just several of the presentations, including Jerry's, really about the demand side, innovative pricing, and bundled prices. But first, I want to set the context. So Jerry, um, and like many people, people focus on prescription drugs at Medicare as Part D. But we really pay for prescription drugs in a number of different ways. One, we pay for them in Part D, and that's about this year. Um, Part D will spend about $100 billion on Part D drugs, um, which will be about, or actually last year, that grew by about 12%. So you hear a lot of people talk about, well, there isn't, prescription drugs aren't a large part of the total spend. 
um, inflation is not that great. In Medicare, it's, it's a growing part of the spend, and um, in Part D, we had about 12% growth last year. The second way we spend money on prescription drugs is in Part B, and this is where I'll disagree modestly with what Jerry said, because the Part B drugs are in most of those models. Um, the difference between Part D and Part B, Part D are the self-administered drugs, the ones you and I would get at the counter from our pharmacy. Part B drugs are typically those that you can only get and if a physician or a physician in a hospital outpatient department administers it. This is a smaller component. It's only $22 billion, but not often you say smaller, $22 billion. Um, but also, in 2007, it was $11 billion, so it's doubled since 2007. So there's clearly uh, a need to focus is there as well. The third part that Jerry did touch on and is actually somewhat of a success story is we pay for prescription drugs not separately but implicitly in our hospital payments. Um, and it is the ultimate bundle. Um, and it is the area where you don't hear a lot of people complaining about prescription drug costs. They're, 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 they exist there and it is something that needs to be focused on. But I think it shows when you look at hospital bundles and we also bundle it in ESRD as several panelists mentioned. Um, a lot of the problems go away because you have strong incentives for providers who are really close to clinical care to be able to make um, informed decisions and choose drugs wisely. So quickly to talk about those two separately, um, Part B drugs, so that's over 50 million beneficiaries. The way we pay for Part B drugs is defined in statute, which is essentially when a physician administers the drug, the physician will be paid the average sales price for that drug. So what does the um, manufacturer report that they get paid for that drug on average plus 6%. The statute doesn't say what that plus 6% is for. There's a lot of hypotheses. Um, there's a number of problems with that approach. One, MedPAC has pointed out that as a physician orders a more expensive drug, that percentage add-on goes up. So if a physician administers a $1,000 drug, they get a 60 $60 payment. They administer a $10 drug, they get a 60 cent additional payment. So there's not a huge body of evidence here, but there's a lot of belief that that skews the choice of drugs by physicians. Um, there is, this is unlike Part D that I'll talk about in a minute, the $22 billion is not an administrated, administered benefit at all. There's no one overseeing whether physicians are choosing the right drug, choosing the most efficient drug, whether patients have gone through step therapy, meaning trying lower cost alternatives before they get to another drug. So it's pure, unadulterated fee-for-service with all the problems that go along with that. So what can we do about that? And Jerry referenced a number of things. I think in Part B, we have a better approach to it, which is in most of the bundled payment models that we're doing, which include ACOs, bundled payments like the joint replacement, but also we have a cancer-specific model um, called the oncology care model. All of those include the Part B drugs. So there is an incentive for physicians who are in those models to choose drugs wisely um, and try to save money and focus on outcomes as opposed to reimbursement. Um, the, the success of that policy will be limited, though, for a number of reasons. One is sometimes Part B drugs have analogs in the Part D world, meaning, so for example, rheumatoid arthritis. Some of the rheumatoid arthritis drugs are in Part D because they're self-administered. Some are in Part B. And if you only have financial incentive to constrain costs on one side, it can create leakage. Um, in addition, you know, it, inherently, we don't really care about physician, uh, excuse me, prescription drug costs. We care about the total cost of care that goes into caring for a patient. And as long as you're carving out pharmaceutical drugs on the Part D side, it's still a, a significant flaw in the model. Um, and as I said, there's no benefit for the physician or the patient to choose drugs wisely. There's no, um, from the beneficiary's standpoint, they're not rewarded if they choose a highly effective drug. They're not rewarded if they adhere to their drug, um, though some of the bundled payment models do create incentives for the physicians to focus on adherence. So switching to the Part D drugs, uh, this is, as Jerry pointed out, 40 million Medicare beneficiaries, $100 billion in spending. The interesting thing is it's not a Medicare administered benefit. We contract with Part D plans, um, and presumably they're doing the management that we all want to see, which is making sure they build a formulary that focuses on value and it in, um, incentivizes and rewards pa patients that choose the right drugs. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention 
about the bundling, Jerry identified, I think, very appropriately one of the, a number of the reasons why we don't bundle in the Part D because it's complex to do so. What he didn't touch on is the financial relationship we have with the Part D plans, which is in, in the Medicare statute, is very complex, meaning we're not simply paying them a capitation rate. The plans are actually bidding on only part of the benefit that the beneficiaries get. The federal government picks up a significant and growing part of it directly through reinsurance, through the catastrophic phase and so forth. Drug manufacturers are financing part of the coverage through the, the donut hole. So when it comes to setting up a bundled payment model, if we were to say all your Part D costs for the people in this room are included in the bundled payment, it's really hard to find out what we actually paid on behalf of any one person through the Part D program. There's also a year-end um, risk sharing. So we, if the plans, even though they're bidding on a limited part of the benefit, if they lose money or gain money, we share that risk. So again, finding a financial settlement where we actually attribute the right amount of cost for a prescription drug to a single beneficiary is very difficult. So what can we do about this? Um, a number of things, and two of these ideas were embedded in the President's budget proposal for this year. One is if we're going to stay with this model where Part D plans are our agents and they're supposed to be managing the benefit, um, can we give them more tools so they can more actively manage the benefit? Um, they come and meet with CMS frequently saying we're hindering their ability to generate savings for us. Some of what they propose is often around restricting access. Um, but there are other areas, so for example, in antipsychotic drugs, we essentially require them to cover all antipsychotic drugs. So you can imagine how much leverage they have with the manufacturers of antipsychotics. They can't exclude them from the formulary. They can't do a lot of the things that they usually do to drive down costs. So there's a number of things we could do to give the plans more authority. The other thing we could do, so the question is, if the Part D plans are only at risk for part of the benefit, and the, the part of the benefit they're not at risk for, which is the very high cost drugs, is the area where it's growing, maybe they would be better agents for us if we put them at risk for those high cost drugs. So one proposal in the President's budget is to systematically start increasing the amount of risk we, move, we attribute to the plans so that they would be paid something closer to capitation and they would have a stronger incentive to get Medicare the best deal. The other one, and this has been very controversial, but the President's budget proposed, well, for some very high cost drugs, maybe this isn't the right model. Maybe the model should be that the agency negotiates these prices. Um, and the President's budget said just for the highest cost specialty drugs. But the notion being negotiating on behalf of 40 million Medicare beneficiaries might generate better prices and better terms than breaking those 40 million beneficiaries up into much smaller groups and having private plans do this. Um, and the last thing I wanted to touch on is everything with bundled payments and ACOs, everything Medicare has been doing in the last couple of years is trying to improve the value of the care we purchase. So not paying providers unless we're incentivizing them to improve the quality of care beneficiaries receive and become more efficient. So the question is, how do you fit um, that into the Part D context? Um, we, have had part, we have had drug manufacturers come to us and say, we want to do a deal with the Part D plans where we promise certain outcomes. And so we give them one price, and if we hit these outcomes, we, we stay with that price. But if we don't produce the outcomes that these prices were tied to, we give a larger rebate back to the plan, back to CMS, perhaps to beneficiaries. The problem with pursuing those currently is a lot of these outcomes are things that happen over three, five, six years um, when you see whether the, ben the beneficiary has really benefited clinically. Our current arrangement with the Part D plans is an annual settlement um, around what happened in that year. So we're exploring, and we've had a number of proposals that have come in, where is there a way to integrate value-based purchasing that might have a longer time horizon and different terms so currently the terms the plans usually negotiate is we'll give you a good spot on the formulary for low price or bad spot on the formulary or off the formulary. And can it focus more on what is the benefit to the beneficiary? What is the cost to the beneficiary? Can you, can you play around with the beneficiary's co-payments for their willingness to adhere to the drug? So that is the universe of things. It's um, very much trying to be part of our value focus in Medicare. 
Um, again, I want to thank everybody. Um, I didn't touch on a number of the patent issues and so forth because they're not um, directly in my purview in CMS, but they are things that we follow very closely and work closely with our colleagues in the FDA on. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for the presentation. So um, now, John, if you want to c come up, uh, John Coster is the director of pharmacy for Medicare and the Child Children's Health Services. Um, as you probably know, this, he has 50 bosses um, in terms of 50 states. Um, so he's got a lot going on his plate and trying to keep track of all 50 states has got to be made. Plus, he's got the responsibility for about 60 percent of the expenditures that uh, the Medicaid programs are done by CMS and the federal government. So he's got 50 and one masters in this set of activities, and I'm glad you got the job. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I actually have 56, if you include the district and the territories, since they all have uh, they all have Medicaid programs as well. Sean's gone, right? Yes. Okay. Now I can give you the real story about Medicare <laughs> now that he's gone. Well, um, thank you again very much. Uh, as Jerry said, I, I am the director of the Division of Pharmacy for CMCS, the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, which is essentially um, the Medicaid uh, program. And um, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program because every Medicaid program is essentially uh, different. Um, Medicaid and Medicare Part D, for that matter, we don't buy drugs. We pay for drugs. So it's a little bit harder for us to do the volume purchasing, buy in bulk um, type approach. I mean, Medicaid right now, actually in terms of number of people, is larger than Medicare, uh, even though Medicare actually spends more on outpatient uh, prescription drugs. Uh, but there are certain government payers that do actually buy drugs, like the VA uh, buys drugs for their facilities, the DOD buys drugs, certain 340B. Uh, entities, they buy drugs. We don't actually buy drugs. We pay for drugs, so we reimburse for drugs. And making it even more interesting for Medicaid is that um, we have a fee-for-service part to Medicaid and we have an MCO par part to Medicaid. So as you know, um, Medicaid delivery models right now, the primary mechanism of delivery is our managed care organizations, kind of like Medicare Part D. Uh, and then we have the fee-for-service side um, to Medicaid. Uh, it's very fortuitous that you have in the room uh, Congressman Waxman because I actually worked uh, for a member of the United States Senate many years ago uh, when Congressman Waxman was chairman of the Health Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he worked uh, along with my boss to create what back then was a really important program for Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid Drug Rebate Program. Uh, because back in the 70s and 80s, uh, the Medicaid programs, uh, because they had little negotiating leverage and because they were payers for drugs, they were paying the highest prices for drugs in the country, which seemed to be truly unfair that a poverty program for the poor was paying the highest prices for drugs. So after a series of hearings and legislative maneuvers and, and things like that, uh, back in 1990, uh, Congress created the Medicaid Drug Rebate Program. And what that program essentially does is it requires drug manufacturers to pay a rebate back to the states for drugs that are dispensed to Medicaid patients. So, for example, at the end of a quarter, uh, a state, play the state of Maryland, will total up how much a uh, Lipitor did we pay for in this quarter through pharmacies. And of course, they get the claims from the retail pharmacies, they total up the drugs that they dispensed and the, that they paid for, and then they bill the manufacturer for a rebate. So in this case, Pfizer would get a bill from the state of Maryland and every other state if Lipitor was dispensed. And that happens for uh, all drugs that want to be covered by Medicaid. A manufacturer has to sign a rebate agreement. And that program has brought in billions and billions and billions of dollars for the states. In fact, just last year, uh, $26 billion in rebates came in to Medicaid. Of course, Congressman Maxson didn't negotiate a cut of that when he was in Congress. Uh, he would have been a multi-billionaire, but gr good public policy as usual, um, and Medicaid now has the ability to, has had and continues to have the ability to save money through the rebate program. In, 19, in uh, 2010, 
those rebates were extended to managed care claims. So that now states are also collecting rebates on drugs dispensed to um, individuals in Medicaid who are in managed care organizations. So in return, however, uh, as we've talked about, you know, everyone has to win, uh, manufacturers uh, were able to get access to the Medicaid population. Because drugs were so expensive to Medicaid programs uh, back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, states were restricting access. Uh, and they were using that restriction as a way of trying to get some price concessions. In return for manufacturers paying rebates, states have to cover the drugs of all the manufacturers that sign uh, rebate agreements. States can use various mechanisms to help manage utilization. For example, they can use preferred drug list. Uh, they can uh, use prior authorization. They can use drug utilization review. But essentially, if a manufacturer signs a rebate agreement with the secretary, the state has to cover the drug on their preferred drug list, although, as I said, they can use utilization management mechanism. So for Medicaid as a, as a payer and not as a direct purchaser, the rebate program has really, really, really helped them to manage um, their costs, so much so that last year the amount of spending on Medicaid drugs was matched almost dollar for dollar by the amount of rebates that were coming in. The problem that states have, as do other payers, is what do we do about the launch prices of new drugs? You know, when a new drug comes to the market, um, how do we manage that? And I think um, HCV drugs has been mentioned prominently here uh, this afternoon, is when the first new HCV, the direct uh, acting antiretrovirals, came to the market uh, back in late 2013, the states had shell shock because they were used to paying for hepatitis C treatments. And of course, these hepatitis C treatments, many of them were not curative and they had side effects. But the first one that came to market was priced for a course of therapy at about $92,000, give or take a, a little bit. Um, and the states were like, look, they were telling us, if we treated everybody we had to treat that had HCV in our state, we couldn't treat anybody else for any other condition. So while the drug was priced, perhaps, uh, you know, at a, at a range that was very difficult for states to, um, to pay for, others argued, yeah, but it's a cure. It's going to help avert, you know, long-term consequences from hepatitis C, uh, liver transplants, other types of uh, medical conditions. But the states, of course, um, having to cover that drug, and they had to cover that drug, as they've had to cover every other uh, drug that's come out since then, started to limit access. They started to restrict access. Some of them had really uh, onerous restrictions. You had to be at a four in your Medivere score before we would even cover it, which is the next step pretty much next to you know, death. Um, other states had more reasonable restrictions. Some states had restrictions uh, on fee-for-service, and other MCOs within their same states had different restrictions. So the HCV drug uh, issue, I think, became um, a symptom for us of the fact that uh, states were, are, were, are struggling, were struggling and continue to struggle with what to do with the price of launch drugs. And we think HCV is the first of many drugs that will come along in the future where the states will say, you know, what are we supposed to do with this? Uh, you know, a lot of the managed care organizations that contract with the states, uh, they're paid a capitated rate. And some of those rates are set based on spending patterns from several years ago. And they couldn't anticipate the HCV drug launches. Uh, so what has happened since then? Well, we at the agency were very concerned about some of the restrictions, and if you are following this issue, you'll know in November we put out a guidance to states that basically said, um, you know, we get it, these drugs are expensive. Um, we get it, manufacturers may have overplayed their hand in pricing some of these drugs. But there are certain rules the states have to follow with respect to access to these medications. Uh, and we put the guidance out. We, we laid out some of the concerns we had in terms of Medivare score or in terms of states not providing access to individuals who had certain substance use disorders or limiting prescribers or the disparity between MCO and fee-for-service. We put the guidance out. And we're currently looking at how and whether states have responded to that in terms of opening access. But at the same time, what happened is other competitors came to market. So you had Sovaldi come to market, you had Arvoni come to market, you had Vicarapac come to market, and now you have the new Merck drug that's on the market. And the other thing that states do to, in order to manage drug costs 
is they negotiate supplemental rebate agreements. So the states have banded together, the state Medicaid programs, in three different large purchasing pools. And what they do is they try to leverage formulary placement with manufacturers to get a better supplemental rebate for these drugs. So on top of the rebate they would get anyway under the rebate program, they would get a supplemental rebate that would have all, help offset some of the expenditures. So what we're hearing that's happening now in the market is with Merck's launch. Merck has indicated where they're coming in in terms of their launch price. They're going in and they're working with the supplemental rebate agreement contractors that the states have to try to get on their formula on the state's preferred drug list. They're trying to knock off Harvoni, and Harvoni has most of the market right now in, in, with respect to state Medicaid programs. And what's Gilead going to do? Well, they're going to try to match the price, perhaps. So I want to say that in that, this respect, competition may be helping states uh, improve access to these drugs, but the states have limited ability, as does Medicare Part D, with the launch prices uh, of the drugs. Um, so we are currently looking at what states are doing with respect to access. How many states have changed access uh, criteria for their uh, HCV drugs since the, since the launch? But we've, this is the first we think of many. We don't put out memorandum like this to the states a lot. We let the states run their programs. Excuse me, basically. The last time we put out something on uh, a drug coverage decision to a state was back in 1996 when states were limiting access to HIV drugs. It's something about the HIV, HCV drugs. Um, and that was the last time we did something like this because we let the states run their programs. But where we see issues relating to states uh, you know, sharply reducing access or where there's, there's a disparity between medical criteria, between fee-for-service and managed care, then we feel like we have to take uh, an additional step, at least at this point. Um, some of the things that were mentioned, the president's budget, uh, with respect to pool purchasing, has a, has a proposal in it for 2017 uh, to allow a greater pool purchasing uh, in Medicaid. Uh, we have a, a good three good purchasing pools going on right now. We don't run them, the supplemental rebate contractors do. But we feel like if you combine the MCO Medicaid lives with the fee for service Medicaid lives, that would create a huge purchasing pool. So this proposal in the president's budget, which has been scored to save billions of dollars. Uh, over the next uh, five years could help states better leverage prices with manufacturers by creating larger uh, negotiating units. Um, Value-based purchasing, uh, Sean mentioned. Uh, there's very little of this going on, as we can tell right now in the market in general, and particularly with Medicaid programs. Um, Medicaid programs have certain challenges to implementing uh, value-based purchasing programs. As some manufacturers have told us, sometimes the costs of implementing these programs far outweigh um, the savings. But I think as we move forward, we're looking for manufacturers who want to volunteer um, on, with programs with states on value-based purchasing. For example, uh, the HCV drugs, uh, the SVR rate uh, reductions are pretty good with these drugs, as we've, been, as we've been told. We don't know what the future is going to hold in terms of relapse, but if, for example, a state paid for 100 patients uh, $90,000, and it's not that price now, it's much lower. But say a state paid a lot of money to treat uh, a cohort of Medicaid patients for HCV, and 20 of those failed. Well, should the manufacturer bear some of the risk in the failure? Uh, it may not be because their drug didn't work well, it may be because the patient wasn't compliant or other factors. But when does the industry have some skin in the game with respect to pricing? When do they actually take on some of the risk of, of uh, the pricing of these drugs. There's certain, there's certain structural impediments to doing that beyond the state's infrastructure and collecting data. There's something in Medicaid that was created um, with the rebate program called best price. Manufacturers have to give their best price to Medicaid and ma many manufacturers have told us that because of best price it limits their ability uh, to do value-based purchasing. Um, specialty drugs, uh, we don't, uh, again, get too involved in the weeds with how the states pay for specialty drugs, and everyone in this room might have a different definition of what a specialty uh, drug is. Uh, but we have several states that contract with PBMs uh, or have limited uh, competitively bid contracts for the specialty type infusion, injection, uh, and in inhalation 
uh, drug. So, um, and then the other things that states do is they closely monitor through their drug utilization review activities what's going on in their states with respect to the prescribing and dispensing of drugs. And they try to work with their prescribers and dispensers. Um, it's, it's, you know, challenging every day. I hear from Medicaid pharmacy directors every day about the challenges they face in providing a quality drug benefit. Um, the, the, you know, the cost of drugs, the, not only uh, new drugs, but existing drugs uh, keep going up. But um, unlike Medicare, uh, we have a statutory rebate in place, and there have some who have suggested that that rebate also be extended to Medicare because a lot of those people in Medicare Part D were dual eligibles in Medicaid, and they were getting, in theory, better prices for their drugs than they're getting now in Medicare, and there are several GAO reports that point that out. But, th but the bottom line is, uh, is this in, in Medicaid. Uh, we face the same challenges as Medicare uh, Part D. We're a payer, not a, not a purchaser. Uh, we have to find new and innovative ways to help states pay for drugs. We have to get more manufacturer skin uh, in the game. We have to build on the success the states have had with the rebate program and the supplemental rebates. Uh, and we have to find a way uh, to expand um, uh, value-based type purchasing uh, in Medicaid. So uh, I'll stop on that note. Again, I'll thank you. I'm not a graduate of Hopkins. I did go to Maryland across the, across the, I don't know what the rivalry is, if there is any, but I did go to, I did go to Maryland at, uh, for, for graduate school. I've never been up this far uh, in, in the city. I've never worked my way all the way up to, to this Hopkins campus. I appreciate the invitation and opportunity, and I'll turn it back uh, to you. <clears throat> can do well there. Good. Um, so, Jamie, if you want to come up. Um, I started the presentation talking about the value of the pharmaceutical industry and the fact that most of us wouldn't be here without them, um, you know, with all the, the illnesses that we've had. So, with that, we wanted to hear from the pharmaceutical industry. Most of the time in academia, we don't talk to them. And I wanted Jamie and, and the whole team to talk about it. And uh, Tanisha, one of our graduates, uh, is at GlaxoSmithKline, and I reached out to her, and she said, well, you know, you ought to have Jamie talk. So with that, Jamie, it's your turn. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson, and everyone was establishing their links to the university. Now you've done it for me. My link is our head of public policy, uh, Dr. Tanisha Carino. So happy to be with you uh, here today. Thanks so much for the invitation. I think you said it right. Is it uh, would have been easy to leave the manufacturer out of the conversation, but I appreciate the fact that, uh, that you've invited me here. Um, my father, I just had to say this, um, now deceased, but was a PhD historian from Cornell University. So the opening session, Dr. Green and Congressman Waxman, uh, he would have loved the whole notion of looking back to possibly inform the future. Um, so uh, right from the opening session, this has been very, very positive. Um, what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is share my view uh, on the topic uh, and as Dr. Anderson uh, requested of us to share some quick comments on some of the policy proposals like uh, Sean Kavanaugh, maybe sticking a little closer to my knitting, things that, that I know a little uh, more than others. So as I think about it, um, the conversation on price, value, access, and affordability over the last 12, 18 months, it's really been forged by extremes. On the one hand, the extreme pricing behavior of companies like Turing, uh, Valiant, as a quick aside, GSK uh, is the owner of Dara Prime in the UK, sells the product for 66 cents a tablet compared to the 750 that uh, was discussed before. So extremes on the one hand, uh, in terms of price behavior, in extreme innovation, on the other, I think as you uh, echoed the productivity out of the industry in terms of R&D output, has increased in 2005, 15 rather, uh, FDA approved 45 new chemical entities. And if you look at 2006 to 2014, the average was 28. So the yield, the productivity coming out of the research and development uh, labs is, is yielding innovation, the list that Caleb showed. Uh, in hepatitis C, in heart failure, in cancer, uh, in HIV, uh, just to name a few. But like uh, Dr. Anderson, I 
often do ask myself, what if we had the luxury of the hepatitis C agents and either disease modification or a cure for Alzheimer's and maybe to throw on another a large tumor type and cancer innovation, how would we pay and afford uh, and make room for that innovation? But I guess from an industry perspective, and this is certainly the way GSK looks at it, uh, the trust and sentiment of the public as evidenced in the survey is probably at an all-time uh, low. It's not uh, what it was when I joined the industry in 1990. Um, and really, that's a consequence, I think, of, of a duality of, of issues. One is the way of working or the business model uh, of the industry, the commercial model. And secondly, and singularly, the, the pricing <laughs> and access issue. So just to share um, a bit on, on GSK, if you'll indulge me. Uh, GSK is a large, diversified, uh, multinational company in consumer healthcare products, global leader in vaccines and pharmaceutical products, including our Vive Healthcare business, which is a joint venture with Pfizer and Chianogi. Um, our current CEO, uh, Sir Andrew Witte, not in the last 12 months, not in the last 18 months, when he became CEO in 2008, recognized that trust was really the fabric of the future. We just celebrated 300 years as a company, all the lineage of GlaxoSmithKline, 300 years. I would like to believe that we'll persist for another 300 years, but in order to do so, we need to restore trust uh, uh, and societal trust, and in particular around, around pricing. But so we have undertaken several things to do that. We were the first to publicly disclose at an anonymized patient level uh, clinical trial data. So good clinical results and poor clinical results, and other companies have started to follow, excuse me. We were the first uh, at the beginning of this year to cease payment to physicians for speaking promotionally on our behalf. And we were the first and still the only company to remove a prospectively defined volume or market share target as a means to compensate through bonus incentives our sales professionals. We did that because we believed that there could be an unintended consequence of encouraging inappropriate use or off-label uh, use. So it stands to reason that a company that's taken these stances would also take very seriously uh, its position on pricing. And on that measure, uh, since 2008, we have consistently and intentionally been in the bottom 50% of our peer group in terms of uh, annualized price increases for established products. Each of our last six launched medicines uh, have been launched at parity or lower list prices than the next best alternative or the current standard of care, which uh, Antonio, I, th I saw in your survey, uh, could be viewed, was viewed as a potential component of what would be considered a fair price. And lastly, on a net basis, uh, incorporating, as uh, John just mentioned, the compulsory uh, discounts as mandated uh, by statute in, in Medicare, uh, sorry, Medicaid, uh, uh, as John uh, elucidated, and the market-driven rebates, our compound annual growth rate on a net price basis over the last five years from 2010 to 2015 is an increase of 1.7 percent. So we think um, we've found what, uh, to me, as I start to get into the, the survey and the policies, is the right balance. Congressman Waxman mentioned the word balance in the panel, and I, that word came up over the lunch as well. Is, um, this is all, in my view, about a balance. Um, we believe that you know, the innovator should uh, be able to gain a profit for their discoveries. Uh, but like the dual uh, entitlement theory, uh, on the other hand, uh, patients or consumers shouldn't be exploited. So it's about finding that balance, being able to be rewarded for the inherent risks of research, discovery, development, commercializing medicines and vaccines, but at the same time ensuring that patients have access and affordability. So um, one policy proposal that wasn't discussed that I think uh, addresses 
perhaps in part John's uh, concerns that payers have. I've always felt that payers, obviously they do care about price. They care as much about price predictability. We're currently restricted from discussing clinical evidence, value, uh, price, intended patient population, et cetera, with payers prior to approval. So to move from the zero-sum game where one entity wins, the other loses, or vice versa, to a shared view, uh, an aligned view, prior to approval, that's one policy proposal that we advocate uh, for very strongly. In terms of uh, variable exclusivity periods, uh, I think as the author acknowledges, it, it, is, it is a bit complicated, especially uh, as you think about the fact that we struggle today to align on a common definition of value against a fixed patent period. Now we'd be compounding value definition against a variable uh, patent period, which could have the unintended consequences of rewarding marginal improvement, uh, lower value, lower spend products, achieving actually a longer period of exclusivity than uh, a true breakthrough uh, innovation. Um, in terms of the regulatory reciprocity, I think that uh, we think that's an idea that has merit and should be considered. Uh, Value-based contracting, I think John explained that very well. Um, operationally, uh, it's proven difficult to align uh, contractual agreements with payers based on outcomes. Uh, and the sophistication needed from a measurement and time period standpoint often uh, it collapses under its own weight for that reason. Um, lastly, the bundled payment um, model that Dr. Anderson described. We do believe that uh, medicine should be included. Uh, that should be evaluated in uh, pilots uh, looking at bundled payment. Obviously, in ESRD, as was mentioned, uh, drugs are already included. The one caveat we would say is that the ambition should be to improve quality and outcomes, not simply look at uh, the cost component, but look at it holistically uh, in a system. And also, the bundle payment needs to accommodate new technology, new innovation coming uh, midstream, perhaps uh, when it wasn't factored into the upfront pricing of the bundle. And then lastly, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharfstein's uh, paper and the comprehensive view of uh, pricing solutions generally, one of the criterion for evaluation was reducing drug spend. And I would just uh, suggest that, um, as was mentioned, there are some drugs where you're getting efficient output outcomes per spend, and maybe some drugs where it's inefficient. So rather than solely looking at reducing drug spend as an end in and of itself, trying to improve the efficiency or effectiveness of that spend, um, we have, uh, I'm most familiar, I suppose, with an old uh, model called the Asheville Project. It was, I'm, I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. This was in Asheville, North Carolina, probably 15 years ago in type 2 diabetes, where pharmacists, through uh, MTM intervention, adherence, compliance, discussion with the patient on appropriate use, were trying to manage for better outcomes in type 2 diabetes. And the outcome of that program was an actual increase in pharmaceutical drug spend, but a lower total system spend. So I think the key is to find where are those pockets where there's underutilization of medicine, there's poor adherence, where actually driving up drug utilization appropriately could actually lower total uh, system costs. So I guess uh, in closing, again, I thank you very much for the invitation. Um, whether or not any of these policies uh, end up uh, being applied. I think the important thing is that we discuss uh, sensible solutions to what is uh, an unsustainable cost trend um, so that in the end the most important stakeholder in the continuum, the patient, have, has uh, the ability to access and affordably uh, leverage the innovation that's coming through. Thank you very much. So let me finally introduce Tricia Newman. Uh, Tricia is the Senior Vice President at the Kaiser Family Foundation, and I'll get the title right, 
uh, director of the Foundation's Program for Medicare Policy and its project on Medicare's future. Trish has worked at the Ways and Means Committee, and most importantly, she's a graduate of Johns Hopkins. <laughs> Okay. Okay. That's fine. They're firing up the projector, and I'm just going to keep talking. There you go. You're up. I'm up. Okay. Well, great. Well, it is really um, an honor to be here, and um, I feel like this is prescription drug boot camp since we've all been at it for quite a while. But I know I found it really interested, interesting. And um, Jerry, I thank you for putting all this together and for inviting me. And Jamie, I think it was just great that you were a part of this meeting because so often the industry is not in with these policy discussions and you're obviously so thoughtful and we're not going to get any further in terms of find, coming up with solutions without the industry at the table as Congressman Waxman was saying earlier tonight, today. Um, and we're, what? Today. today. I just feel, well, you know. Um, anyway, we are all here for common interests, which is that um, we are all here because we think people should get that the drugs that they need at an affordable price and that the costs are reasonable and fair to payers, including people in an, in an environment where they're constrained resources. And that's a big package of things that we're all trying to achieve, but I think we are trying to achieve it. I'm going to um, focus a little bit like some of the speakers have on Medicare. Uh, because that's the area where I've spent a whole lot of time thinking, and it's also because Medicare is a big payer, as you heard from Sean Cavanaugh a little bit earlier. He gave you some numbers, but the bottom line of his numbers is that Medicare today is 20% uh, of Medicare spending today, or close to it, is for prescription drugs when you put it all together, inpatient and outpatient. So it's kind of a big deal for Medicare. And it's also a big deal, and I'm sorry to be focusing on cost. I also mean to focus on value, but if you look at costs, which you can see in, in this ch colorful chart, is that Medicare spending on drugs took off after the implementation of the drug benefit, which was great because that meant people were getting drugs and Medicare was paying for it. But Medicare spending on drugs has really been ticking up and is 29% uh, today and going to 34% within the decade. So this is a big issue for a program that is concerned about costs. And it is why people are paying attention to drug pricing and drug costs generally. Now, back um, years ago, I, I was a history major, although I'm not a historian, but I do respect history. Um, when the drug benefit was, and you even used a word I didn't use, the historicity or something like that. Um, back uh, when the Medicare drug benefit was enacted, there was a lot of concern um, it reflected in the top red line about what the cost of the drug benefit would be, and that in part explains why there what is this funky donut hole. There, uh, people didn't believe there'd be enough money over time to pay for it. Um, and as you can see here, the costs of Part D have been so much lower than what the actuaries and CBO projected. There were big fights, and there have been big fights about why was that? Was it because competition between private plans worked? Some people definitely believe so. Was it because of generics coming onto the market? Some people definitely believe so. And was it, or was it estimator error? And some people definitely believe it was that. These are largely academic fights, but the bottom line is, this bottom line is no longer staying flat. And because drug spending is rising now so much more rapidly than anybody has ha had projected in recent years, um, we're all talking about this, and we will continue to talk about this. We will continue to talk about it because drug costs under Part D are projected to rise so much more rapidly in the next decade. And as you can see, this is looking at per capita Part D spending, which almost didn't grow. I mean, 1.5% average annual growth rate is, is kind of like not growth in, in the scheme of a big government program. Um, but what you can see is in the next decade, uh, Part D spending is expected to grow by 6.5%. Um, that's an average annual growth rate, so that's a lot. And that's why we have to talk about solutions, and that's um, why we're here. Um, a lot of people have talked about Savaldi, so I'm not going to talk that much about it, just to make the point that the numbers that you've seen here translate into big dollars, again, for Medicare from 1% of Part D spending in 2013 to 6% in 2014 to 10% in 2015, 
So if you're looking at $92 billion, I was thinking about Jerry's comment about an Alzheimer's drug, and I think you said $400 billion. So relative to what we're spending today, it's just like a non-starter to think about what that would mean for sudden, a sudden increase in um, spending. It is, um, it's obviously something we need to pay attention to. Um, I want to um, switch gears and talk about people for a second, not just program spending, because I want to show you what this means for people. We think of Part D as a program that provides pretty good benefits, except for the donut hole that everybody has been talking so much about, but Medicare does not cap out-of-pocket spending. It has an out-of-pocket threshold, a catastrophic threshold. What that means is there's a big cost to people for some of these high-cost drugs when they reach the catastrophic level. They're paying thousands of thousands of dollars. I don't have the dollars here for Humira, Savaldi, and Revlimid, but I'm showing it relative to median income. And my point here in terms of policy options is this is an issue for people if they can afford if they can find the money, it's obviously a big out-of-pocket expense. If they can't find, find the dollars, then even though Part D might pay for a drug, people are going to go without the drugs that they need because their Part D plans aren't going to cover the full cost of the drugs. One of the policy options that's actually not on the table is providing a real limit on Part D out-of-pocket spending. So maybe as you're thinking about your sets of policy options, you might think about whether or not that would be um, something to add. Actually, this whole set session today has been great for stimulating ideas about new policy options. Um, so we did do do surveys, and we've done a lot of uh, testing of the public um, about uh, what they think about drug prices. And I guess medical students, in some ways, are representative of the general public, which was um, great to hear. Um, but people are just, they think these drug prices are unreasonable. And they're blaming the pharmaceutical companies. They're not really blaming the insurance companies. They think that something, something's not quite right. It doesn't pass the fairness test when they hear about all these um, prices that are, that are coming out. Um, and uh, many people are quite supportive of various policies that they hear about. I have to say, I don't think they know a lot about the details underneath them uh, because you know, you call them and they're answering the phone while they're cooking dinner and they go, oh yeah, I want the government to negotiate drug prices for seniors. But you can see there's sort of a general flavor of yes, this is a, this is a good thing and this is something we want to do. And this to me is really interesting. This is true on a bipartisan basis. So, so when we ask people this particular question is what they think about having the government negotiate lower drug prices for people on Medicare. You could see more than 80% of Republicans, independents, and more than 90% of Democrats like this idea. They're favorable about this idea. So the challenge, and the one that we're kind of here to talk about today, is how do you get underneath this broad sense of we need to do something to make drugs more affordable for people and sort of bring it down to sort of the nitty gritty detail, details that are required in order to um, make this work. Um, this particular policy is one that's sort of generally discussed. It was generally included in the Obama administration's budget this year, in term, but uh, specifically for unique drugs and high-cost drugs. Uh, but not much, not much detail, and the actuaries took a look at it, and they said, yeah, well, not much detail. We're not going to give you any savings for that either. So it's an idea that's out there, but it doesn't really seem to have um, the savings that are required to make a difference, at least in per the, um, the scorekeepers. But there are um, almost an infinite number of options that are out there, and a lot of good ones were presented today. I think the, the point, I, I guess if I had one point I would, I would leave you with that hasn't been um, said before, is while there are many options on the table, and we can talk about the strengths and weaknesses and the benefits and limitations of, of, of some of these options, I'm not sure there's the political will to do something, and maybe Congressman Waxman will talk more about that. Um, people talk a lot about this, but it's not my sense um, that something's about to happen in a very, in a big and a meaningful sense. Um, there's sort of, there's a lot of conversation, but not much action. So I think part of the challenge that um, people who care about this issue face is keeping the issue visible trying to um, talk about it in a way in terms of what it means for people, 
why this is an important issue. The people themselves don't really care about the specific components. They just want to be able to get the, the drug that they need um, when they need it at an affordable cost. And um, that's why the, the hard work needs to be done. Um, I don't really have time to talk about other proposals, but I think uh, several of them are really worthwhile. And I have que as many questions, probably, as I have comments about them. Um, I think looking at it from the public health lens is a really um, great and different approach and one that we ought to be doing more of. On bundling, I think the, quest the question that comes to my mind is that seems to be useful for trade-offs between different types of services within the bundle, but I don't know how it addresses underlying like launch price issues. And you know, that raises the question about whether or not physicians or whoever's controlling the bundle are really in a position to negotiate to leverage down lower prices. It did make me think, as, as you were talking, about how is it in a Medicare environment that we can get physicians to be more sensitive to equivalent prices equivalent drugs when there's such a big price difference. And of course, that brings to mind my mom and her doctor, and how her doctor, who's a terrific doctor, but he really doesn't pay attention to what's covered under this Part D plan versus that Part D plan, and whether her drug is on the formulary or not, or whether it's Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, or specialty tier drug. I can't really blame him. That's a lot of work, even though I sort of blame him because he's a concierge doc, but I shouldn't. <laughs> Um, but the point is this, maybe we could think about some incentives for the Medicare program to encourage physicians to pay more attention to these issues on behalf of their patients because my mom is going to leave with a prescription. If her doc says she should take this, this is a true story, generic sleeping medication because that's the one that he prefers for her, she's going to fill it. She's going to come home and tell me that she can't believe she had to pay $300 for this generic because it was all formulary. She didn't understand that. So somebody needs to create an environment, work on creating an environment where the prescribers are helping their patients choose among equivalent drugs so that we're not spending money needlessly, both on behalf of the Medicare program and also on behalf of their patients. I could go on, I actually have a bunch of other ideas, but I know we're being very sensitive to time, even though I haven't seen like a scary one minute come up. Um, but um, anyway, thank you. I think this has been a really interesting day, and I'm very grateful to be here at my alma mater on its 100th anniversary. And thanks for putting this together. So um, that's been great. Henry, we'll ask you, First as the historian to talk, and now as the sort of the next step. So where do we go from here now that you've listened to all this discussion? Where do we move forward? Well, I thought the uh, presentation that Tricia Newman just made of uh, some of the pluses and the minuses of the various uh, proposals was an excellent one. Uh, as I look at this problem, it seems to me that the public looks at a few instances and jumps to conclusions. They look at the Shkreli situation where uh, the man was completely out of line and raising the prices the way he did. They look at the genuine concern that we have about the hepatitis C drug, and we don't know what to do with a situation like that. It's a real problem, and we have to think it through. But as I indicated earlier, one of the biggest problems we have is just a steady increase in the price of drugs. If you listen to the presidential debates, they have the answers. They seem to have the answers for everything. And their answer is, should I go back here? Yes, please. OK. We're on camera. <laughs> oh, on camera. Oh, OK. I thought that what Tricia Newman had to say <laughs> <laughs> was excellent. And we've listened to these uh, problems as we uh, at possible solutions. And the public, of course, is outraged at the high price of drugs. But they are looking at, this, at these uh, idiosyncratic issues, uh, like Mr. Shkreli and, uh, and the hepatitis C drug. Uh, with the hepatitis C drug, for example, uh, we did see a reduction in the price when there was competition. So I keep coming back to 
competition is one of the best cures for overpricing of drugs. But it, I think it becomes oversimplified when we have the presidential candidates come up with a solution. If only Medicare can negotiate the prices. It sounds right. On the other hand, we do have negotiations with the pharmaceutical benefit uh, manu manu uh, PBMs and manufacturers, but uh, managers, but I don't know that if the government negotiated, we'd get any much better deal than that, what they're getting now. So it is a much more complex problem to say that there's an easy answer. So we've got to try out some ideas, think through some ideas, but whatever is proposed, it involves trade-offs. It involves trade-offs that some of which we've had discussed today and some of which we'll realize as we think through in more granular detail uh, about the various proposals. So uh, as, uh, as we go forward thinking about these proposals, I think uh, the scholars did an excellent job. I'm still plowing through the whole list of details of the proposals. I think they were very, very good, whether we should put them in a bundle, whether we should look at it as a public health problem, whether we should uh, 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 approach the, the payers and how the payers handle it. Uh, I'm not going to touch on all of them, but uh, very few issues unite Democrats, Republicans, and independents. They're all united on the idea that we pay too much for drugs, and outraged people are outraged if, if those who need those drugs cannot get access to them. Uh, that unites us all, but what will divide us is when we start looking at each of the solutions. And sometimes there is no one solution. There are trade-offs that we have to decide as a society what trade-offs we're willing to accept. So after sitting here and listening uh, all afternoon, as we have all done, I'll leave with the idea that I'm really pleased that Johns Hopkins has uh, taken on this responsibility to look at the issue and, and look at all the possible strands of approaching uh, a solution uh, and, uh, and policymakers will have to sort through it all, but uh, it's not an easy resolution. We just have to keep uh, looking for some things that we could try out. And quite frankly, when you think you have a resolution and enact it into law, as I look back on all the years we've had the Hatch-Waxman Act, no, there's no one solution. Whatever solution you get will lead to other problems, so we have to keep revisiting them. Thank you all very much. Please to participate. So uh, Josh gave me a challenge, which is to get the, the, the uh, meeting on time. I'm sorry. Josh gave me a challenge to get, get the meeting done on time, and we've, we've accomplished that. Um, there is a reception. Um, following this, so I'm hoping that everybody will get a chance. I know that I haven't given you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I wanted to make sure that we got all the presentations out, but hopefully people will be able to stay for a little bit and ask the questions of the people about whatever option they have or you know what's the industry's position or all those different kinds of things. So with that, where is the reception? Okay, thank you, wall of wonder.